United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Doreen, could you please call the roll? Nicholas McGee. Here. Rachel Hendrickson. Here. Roger Bealey. Here. Richard DuPerry. Here. Rick Munking. Here. Okay, we do not have Jen tonight, so Rick DuPerry will be a voting member this evening. And no Robin, which means that we have Rick Munking is also going to be a voting member. Uh, approval of the minutes, we do have the July 10th draft. We do not have July 1st, so we're going to table the July 1st minutes. Uh, June 10th, uh, I'll make a motion to um, accept the minutes for June 10th, 2019. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Show that unanimous. Thank you. First item on the bid this evening is a consent item. Crossroad Holdings LLC requests a final subdivision plan review as part of a planned development project for the Downs Innovation District, 90 Payne Road, Assessor's Map R52, Lot 4. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a quick reminder, this is the Scarborough Downs property, the northern portion with access off of Payne Road. Uh, so the applicant uh, has been in front of the board uh, several to many times. Um, with the final, tonight's the final subdivision plan for the entire phase two site, it includes 57 light industrial and commercial lots. After a, thorough, after a thorough review process, the board did move this item to a consent item for tonight's agenda. Uh, the remainder of staff comments have been incorporated into a draft motion as conditions of approval for the board's consideration. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, does the applicant have anything they want to uh, comment on? <coughs> I really don't. Uh, thanks for uh, having us here tonight. We've gone through the conditions of approval and are in agreement, so if the board could see fit to approve it tonight, we certainly would appreciate it. Thank you very much. Does anyone on the board have anything to add or discuss? No? All right. With that said, I move to approve the project titled The Downs Innovation District proposed by Crossroads Holdings, LLC, as depicted on the plan set prepared by Goral Palmer, dated 7-3-19, with the following findings, waivers, and conditions. Findings, the applicant is proposing a subdivision for the entire phase two site on the Scarborough Downs property that includes 57 lots, consisting of a mix of light industrial, manufacturing, research, and technology uses along with general commercial and retail type development. The subdivision also includes a public trailhead and open space. Subdivision is located in the Crossroads Plan Development Zoning District and is further identified on the Town of Scarborough tax maps as map R52, lot four. Planning board has reviewed the application and supporting documentation and finds that the proposed design on the site plan adequately addresses the requirements of the subdivision and zoning ordinances. Waivers, one, allow the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife and the Maine Historic Preservation Commission to review the application materials as part of their Maine DEP Site Location and Development Act application. Two, roadway design to be developed in accordance with the details provided on the plan set. Conditions, one, Prior to the release of the Mylar, the plan set shall be revised to address the staff and peer review comments in the memos prepared for the 7-22-19 planning board meeting, including the stormwater design and details for the associated infrastructure. The updated plans, calculations, and models shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. <coughs> Excuse me. Two, condition, uh, condition two. Prior to the release of the Mylar, the applicant shall A, coordinate with staff and revise the memorandum of understanding and plan notes identifying the maintenance and ownership of responsibilities of the amenities located within the future public right-of-ways and the associated stormwater command systems beyond the right-of-ways. B, execute and record the maintenance agreement as required by the post-construction stormwater management ordinance. C, revise cross-easement agreement and declaration of covenants as noted in the staff review memo dated 7-22-19. D, coordinate with the fire department on the proposed bollards and boulders to be placed at the entrance to the trail along Innovation Way. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Three, prior to the approval of site plan applications within phase two, the applicant shall provide A, approval from the Scarborough Sanitary District for the sewer pump station. B, approval by the main DEP. C, approval by the main DOT, a traffic movement permit. D, address the remaining issues related to site access, off-site improvements, and other traffic-related elements. Four, prior to the start of construction, the applicant shall A, provide a construction sequency and phasing plan for the entire phase two subdivision, including designated laydown areas. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. B, conduct a pre-construction meeting. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, and their site contractor, and is to be coordinated through the planning department. 
prior to the certificates of occupancy. Within phase two, the applicant shall construct any required off-site roadway improvements associated with the traffic permitting process. That is the motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second. I have a motion to second. Any discussion on the motion? All in favor. Rick, are you, oh, thank you. Okay, so that is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sorry. All right, let the record show that Ms. Saunders has joined us. And Mr. Meinking, you no longer have the obligation to vote during this meeting. <laughs> All right, item number six. Eau Claire Hair Care, LLC, requests a site plan amendment for 152 Black Point Road, Assessor's Map, U11, Lot 5. Mr. Mel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This project's located in the TVC3 zoning district along Black Point Road. The applicant's proposing a 692 square foot building addition uh, for the expansion of the existing hair care, hair, hair salon on the first floor and residential unit on the second floor. The applicant's also proposing modifications to the existing parking on the site. Zoning standards require a 25 foot setback with buffering where a lot abuts the residential district. Uh, so it appears that the entire rear property line and portion of the southerly property line abuts the R2 zoning district. So the board should provide feedback on the type of buffering prov provisions that are appropriate uh, for this area. <laughs> the site plan ordinance also requires a landscape plan uh, be provided for projects that create 10 or more parking spaces. Um, the applicant has indicated that any new landscaping on the site will match the existing. Um, the board should provide direction to staff and the applicant on whether a landscape plan should be provided. And staff has provided the board with a motion with conditions uh, for your consideration this evening. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Jamal. The applicant, please introduce yourself and uh, do a brief overview of what you have left remaining to discuss with this planning board this evening. Yep. Uh, good evening. My name is Travis Letelier from Northeast Civil. I'm um, here with uh, the applicant and owner, um, Guy Eau Claire. Um, so uh, one, one thing I, I would like to address first off is the parking and the landscaping. Um, there's a, a note in, in, the, in, the, in the memo here about adding 14 parking spaces, where in reality we're only adding four parking spaces to the site. Uh, there, are, there are currently 20 um, on the site existing, and we'll be expanding to 24. So um, I, think, I think where the confusion is, is, is on the existing boundary plan that we submitted, only 10 spots were delineated on that plan, uh, where there is actually a, a back parking space, uh, a back parking lot for six, for six cars. Is, it, is, it, is, your, is your mobile, is that mobile one on right now? Get a little feedback. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so in the back parking, there are actually six parking spots, and then there's also three garage spots. So um, the existing the existing plan actually has 20, and, and we're expanding to 24 in the. Would you please highlight that out on the plan where the existing ones are located? I think it may be underneath. There's the existing. Is that what you want? Yeah. There are yeah. 10 parking spots for the customers that are delineated, but there's a, this is actually a customer, <coughs> sorry, a, a parking area for the uh, employees in the back, which actually is six parking spaces, and then there are actually three garage spaces as well. So, so ten, ten, six, and three? And then, and then there's also actually a parking space in the, uh, in the uh, tent garage that, that's on site. That would be the, the 20th existing spot, which the tent garage isn't, isn't shown on this plan. Right. Uh, can I quickly just uh, put you on pause and just ask staff if that that current layout is I don't even know how to phrase that question. Does it does it jive with what you were um, anticipating for existing parking spots, or because there's a lack of delineation in that area, does that not necessarily count as official parking spots? 
Uh, we read it as, you know, there's, we counted the spots that were on the plan. So we, we see it as 10, but I guess um, it could be just, I guess it could go either way. It's just, I counted 10 spaces, so that's what I wrote. Um, but I guess it could be discussed that there are more that just aren't delineated on the survey plan. Um, I guess they are technically parking spaces, they're just not marked. Yeah, there's no, so. there's no striping associated with the back, the back lot. And there are three, definitely three garage spaces as well. And then my follow-up question to that is, is how does that, um, if you do count those as additional spots, how does it impact um, one of those main elements you would do? If the board accepts these uh, non-marked spots, then a landscape plan wouldn't technically be required uh, in accordance with the site plan ordinance. Thank you, Jamal. All right, please continue. Um, the other, the other, one of the other outstanding comments was uh, regarding the sign. Um, the existing sign, which will be moving as part of this uh, site plan, is is only uh, nine square feet uh, currently, and it's it's there's no changes proposed to the plant to the sign. Um, and the sanit there is also a comment about the sanitary uh, department. Um, they are looking into the existing flows, and there there may be uh, a need to purchase additional flow from the sanitary department. But uh, there was no uh, issue that, uh, as far as type of flow or anything that uh, came up with my discussion with David Hughes. Um, with that, I, I, I open up to any questions you might have, and. Uh, Thank you very much. Okay. Yes. I guess I'd like to confirm with staff that if if there were twenty, if there were, is I'm worried about existing nonconformance, meaning does this location require ten or twenty parking spots? Do you see what I'm saying? Because if it if only previously ten were permitted even though we we're gonna draw them in a different space, um, you, we're still getting a net increase of you know, potentially 14 kind of a thing. So I guess I'm just wondering, is this something that can be worked out um, offline? Um, and if it is that, uh, uh oh, I'm getting the, the bull eyes from Jay. Nope. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I just didn't, you know, because I, I think a landscape plan is an important element whenever you have this much parking area, and I'm just concerned about existing nonconformance. Whether it, 10 were needed or 20 were needed, if we could just get that, because um, I I just hate to put staff on the spot right now, kind of a thing, I guess. Is. I'd have to do a calculation on the spot. Um, I don't want you to have to do that, yeah. I guess is what I'm saying. Um, but I assume that 10, more than 10 yeah. spaces were needed. Um, yeah. They just weren't delineated on the okay. site, so. We counted the spaces that were delineated as parking spaces. Right. If they're not marked, and they typically aren't parking spaces. So yeah, that's how we looked at it. Yeah, and I think you alluded to this, but the, the main, how this really impacts us is whether or not we are going to require them to submit a, a landscaping, landscaping plan. plan. Yep, so. absolutely. Um, I guess my other question, if I can continue, Mr. Chair, mm -hmm is regarding the pool and the relocation of the pool. I, I think the staff did a really good job of documenting the, that you know the pool was tried to be permitted last time, but I guess never really went through the technical procedure. And I'm just wondering if that same thing was done with parking spaces, like, oh, we need 14, but it wasn't permitted for 14 or 20 or whatever kind of thing. So, so um, what's the deal with the pool? So the, 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 I think what what's written in the in the memo there is, is correct. It's correct. It, it was uh, previously submitted for a permit, but I, I don't believe that permit was ever paid for or picked up, and then obviously expired after one year. So, okay. Um, and then the pool was put in um, <clears throat> without the permit, but uh, okay. with with the site plan, we're we're hoping to you know re-permit that new location uh, on mm -hmm. the site. So I would re I would revisit my concerns regarding existing conformance or non-conformance and ask if there are any other permits pending. Um, moving on to the to the bottom of the memo from the staff. Um, knowing that Scarborough, you're in the process of working with Scarborough Sanitary District, are there any other permits that you foresee being requested or in, in process? 
other than the building permit after after we get this approval. No. No. Okay. Uh, that ends my questions. Thank you, Robin. Rachel. Uh, yeah, my questions kind of flow along um, the same line as, as Robin's because I started counting and kept getting terribly confused as I counted the, the spots that you that you had. Uh, I have a question about the, the garage. Now, you indicate there's spacing for three, the tent garage, that there's spacing for three cars in there? I'm um, talking about the actually existing, the existing building has three um, garage spaces in, you know. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's the tent? No, 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 that's not the tent. No, that's part of the actual building itself. The tent is actually placed on, on, on top of the pavement currently. All right, so my, my question on that is, they, so you're planning on storing vehicles in there? Um, Poss, I'm not exactly sure exactly what's going to be stored in there, but it, it, it can be used as a parking space. All right, how would you access that since you've set up four parking spaces in front of it, presumably with curbing? Right. Well, it would be, it would be more of a more of a storage space or, or a parking space for, for something that's not used all that uh, I guess the, I guess the, the parking in front of it would be more of a during the day use uh, for employees or customers of the air care facility. What happens uh, with snow storage as you plow out the lot? You're going to pl block in the uh, tent? And I believe we can plow around that and, and make, it, make it still work. And the snow storage goes where? It'll be It'll be to the to the right of the right of the tent. Right. So that's in the vegetated buffer that you have. That's where you. Yeah, that's a gra it's a grassed area, and it's it's you know it's got some existing trees and shrubs. Um, was this tent permitted? Is it uh, temporary or permanent, or is it actually since it's it says temporary, uh, it does it ever come down, or is it basically always up? Uh, I believe it's it's mostly up, but it's definitely a, a temporary structure. There's no permanent foundation, or it's a it's a, a pole and, and fabric structure. Yeah, I've, and I've reviewed the definition that that uh, that you folks pointed out, and it is um, although you use the word structure, it doesn't seem to fit the definition of structure. But that makes it a temporary edifice. Let's call it. Um, and one of the issues that we had, uh, one issue was around the landscaping to kind of buffer that from the view, but another question that, that I have that I've had difficulty kind of working my way through, um, as you started to look at whatever you had for the stormwater management, what actually, what calculations did you use for determining the stormwater management? Did you at any time use the impervious surface under the tent, since it's a concrete slab. Um, how, so you're proposing to add uh, impervious surface with the addition. Correct, yes. Uh, and you've got 611 square feet uh, under that tent. Was that ever figured into any of the calculations of impervious surface in order to come up with what would be effective stormwater management? It, it was actually. I, I did. I did take into consideration the, that square footage in the overall site uh, expansion of impervious area. That's part of the hydrocad calculations and, and the overall number I have for the uh, expansion of impervious area on the site. Okay. Um, I still would like to see. I, I think <clears throat> there's a question about. Uh, the landscaping plan. I would still like to see buffer buffering or some some mitigation of the starkness of the land around that tent. In other words, some sort of plantings. Uh, and I do think you need additional additional buffering to the rear and uh, to the back of the property. Um, I would like to compliment you and the Eau Claire folks on the architecture that you're using. Um, to build that and create that, uh, that addition. I would also like to say that as a closet to die for on the second floor, uh, that I would love to have that. Uh, and um, I appreciate all the effort you put into this. Thank you.
Thank you, Major. Rick. Uh, I went through it. I'd just like to kind of echo what Rachel said about buffer. So um, I know you're only putting an addition on, and you pointed out you're leaving the natural landscaping that's there. But because you are adding something, um, it would be a good opportunity to try to add some buffering around that tent and around, the, on the, around that, that one side if you can. Yep. Um, is there any suggestions you might have? Um, we're not, uh, not we're opposed still here. to it, but... No white ball. <laughs> um, I don't really have a suggestion, honestly. I'm not whatever would best shield that um, area from the from the residential district. May I point out um, also that sort of the back property line uh, does abut the uh, the large church parking lot. So there's not actually any residential property out in the back. Um, the other the other line on the uh, sort of northeast of the of the property line, the other residential area is the uh, is a park is a I think a, a city park, which and there there is some existing buffering. I I did go over to that site the other day and, and looked back from that from the gravel parking in the park area and you you can't even see the the, the building itself. So. Um, okay. Yeah, I was just looking at the um, the staff notes. It's no, no. I, I recognize that the properties are residential for sure, um, but it is a it is a church property with a couple hundred parking spaces off to the right, off to the left there, and then okay. a, a city a city park. Um, right. Okay. To the other I side. I see your point. That's a good point. That's all. I have. Rachel. If I could respond on that, um, that it, the fact that there's a very large parking lot in back of that is all the more reason to do some plantings there um, because the, the trees uh, or whatever you're planting there will actually um, ameliorate some of the perhaps runoff from a very large parking lot. So that's to me that's kind of being a good neighbor and thinking about not just your own property but the, the rest of the town. Uh, so I still think there should be some uh, buffering there. And we do have um, in the zoning ordinance a list of appropriate plants and trees uh, and guidelines on what um, can be used to provide that buffering. So I, I would suggest you take a look at it. And what that's leading to is you might need the landscape plan, uh, somebody who can help you come up with a, a good plan for that. Thank you, Rachel. Um, Roger. <coughs> Um, I guess I'm going <coughs> to offer a contrarian point of view regarding the buffering. Um, that is a parking lot, and to me, when the church went in there, they should have been put in, putting in the buffering because that's a residential property that we're talking about right now. So um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to push the buffering, additional buffering on that, that portion of the uh, boundary that is adjacent to the church. Uh, it is just a parking lot, and um, I um, I think that's all I'll say at this point. Thank you, Roger. Rick? I don't know if this is working, but I'll talk loud. Um, I, I will go along with uh, Roger uh, just looking at it. If they needed some buffering for that parking lot, it should have been put in when that road that butts up with the parking lot. It should have gone in. Doesn't look like there's a whole lot of room where we can do a lot of buffering. Um, so I would be inclined to say, um, given the parking lot in the background, uh, I don't need to see any more buffering. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> um, so for what it's worth, I'll weigh in too. Uh, I, do, I do think um, you should provide a landscaping plan whether it's minimal uh, buffering, um, just a little extra is going to help. I, I don't think you need to go um, full bore. And there, I mean, you are abutting a parking lot. We understand that. Um, but I think, you, I think it needs to be part of the plans you submit. So I, I will point out that what, what we're showing on the plan does seem minimal, but it's actually a, a pretty substantial 
Stan. So that maybe there's very little that you can add, but I think we um, we should be able to see this and also have record of what you're proposing over there. So um, that said, that's kind of where I fall down. It's part of the condition we have for a motion um, is that you will submit a landscaping plan to staff and they'll review it if they feel it's adequate. What you what you're proposing, we won't see it again. <laughs> so, all right. Okay. Um, that said, is there anything before I jump into this? I guess so. Robin. Yeah, I guess I would just, you know, sort of like buffering on one side, buff not less buffering on the other. I would like to reiterate that I do agree with uh, Rachel and Rick on the need for additional buffering because of the parking lot next door. So um, I, I guess we're kind of split three and three kind of thing, but I think um, I don't know what we want to do with that. I think what I'm saying is I think they need to submit a landscape plan Good. and staff is going to review it. And make sure they're satisfied compliant. with what they see. Good. Okay. So let's handle that way. Thank okay. you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. I move to approve the site plan amendment project titled Eau Claire Hair Care, proposed by Eau Claire Hair Care LLC, as depicted on the plan set prepared by Northeast Civil Solutions, dated 7819, with the following findings and conditions. The applicant is proposing to construct a 692 square foot addition for the expansion of existing hair salon on the first floor and residential unit on the second floor. The proposal also includes modifications to the existing parking area and the relocation of an existing fabric parking garage and above ground pool on site. The property is located within the town and village center's fringe TVC3 zoning district and is identified on the town of Scarborough tax maps as map U11 lot 5. The planning board has reviewed the application and supporting documentation and finds that the proposed design of the site plan adequately addresses the site plan review and zoning ordinance requirements for site utilization, layout, access, internal vehicular movement, pedestrian ways, landscaping, stormwater management, architecture, signage, utilities, and storage. Conditions. One. Prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall revise the plan set to include A, additional buffering provisions along the rear and side property lines where they abut the R2 zoning district as discussed with the planning board, B, a landscape plan that includes proposed plantings on site, C, additional details about the existing sign on the property to ensure it meets the zoning requirements. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Two. Prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall A, provide approval from the Scarborough Sanitary District, B, per permit the existing above ground pool on the property with the codes department. Three, prior to the start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, and their site contractor, and is to be coordinated through the planning department. That is the motion. Second. I have a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor. So that's unanimous. Thank you. Good luck. Next item, number seven, Jay Chatmus requests a preliminary uh, subdivision review for 34 New Road, Assessor's Map 35, Lot 17. And if that is not how I say the last name, my apologies. Is it Chatmus? And it's Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so this project's located in the RF in Aquifer Protection Overlay Districts. And the applicant was last before the board uh, back in October uh, for a sketch plan review. And they're before the board tonight uh, for a proposal for a six-lot residential conservation subdivision served by a paved public street. So as the board may recall, uh, during past reviews, a key consideration of the project was providing access to the property's uplands that results in the least amount of impact to the wetlands as possible. The designers provided an analysis with the submission that includes two roadway options, indicating the proposed wetland impacts uh, for both. Staff is comfortable with the proposed access to the site given the applicant is proposing a right-of-way extending um, from the end of the proposed road to the property's northerly boundary. All future development on the remaining land of the applicant will be required to be accessed uh, from this right-of-way, resulting in one curb cut along new road, new road. As previously noted, the project is located in the Red Brook uh, watershed, which has been listed as an urban impaired stream uh, by Maine DEP. So the applicants provided a 75-foot buffer around the tributary stream uh, on the property. This, this uh, buffer is consistent with the Red Brook Management Plan. Staff does recommend the applicant provide a 75-foot buffer around the entire portion of the stream on the property and designate it as a no-disturb no buffer. And this could result in modifications to lots 1 and 6. The zoning standards require open space areas within conservation subdivisions to be contiguous areas that buffer the natural resources on the property. 
The majority of the open space appears to be contiguous, however, there appears to be an opportunity to co connect the open spaces uh, behind Lot 1. So staff has recommended the applicant reduce the size of Lot 1 and replace the rear portion of the lot with open space, as it would result in more contiguous open space as required by the zoning ordinance. And staff provided some uh, comments. There's some general stormwater concerns um, that should be addressed with the board tonight. And there has there were two um, public two letters from the public that were received and distributed to the board um, before this meeting. Thanks. Thank you, Jamal. I'd like to give an overview of some of the items that uh, staff has touched upon, please. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the board, I'm Jim Fisher with Northeast Civil Solutions. Uh, pleasure representing uh, Jay and Carmen Chapmas this evening. Uh, Mr. Chapmas is with us uh, here as well. And uh, Travis Atelier was also, he was just before you, was also the lead engineer on this particular project. So if there's any uh, technical aspects of any questions, we'd be happy to have Travis come back up and address those. Uh, in the interest of brevity, however, I will try to go through uh, most of this relatively quickly since we have seen it before. Jamel has been very thorough in, in doing a portion of my job for me. Thank you very much. Um, what I'd like to do is, as I point to the screen, given that my pointer doesn't work on the, uh, on the televised screens, I'd like to just refer to occasionally to uh, what's behind you, and I'll let you know when I'm, I'm uh, going to show that. Um, so I'd like to just kind of go through this fairly quickly. Uh, again, Jamel has touched on uh, all the highlights and, and a few of the others. As far as the, uh, the main elements that staff has identified for consideration for the board, the paper street to which Jamel refers, and I'm going to be referring to the screen right behind you, this is this section that's right up in here. This is the actual paper street. Paper street's kind of a bad word nowadays. We don't actually intend to do anything with that, but as staff has recommended, that would be the particular area that would be able to access the rest of this property should it ever get developed in the future. Mr. Chat, Mr. and Mrs. Chapmans, who live on this project or in the property right here, they have no intentions of developing, developing it uh, for as long as they stay there. It may not be developed for quite a long time, but suffice it to say that at some point in time, it probably would get developed. And staff was concerned that we minimize the number of curb cuts off of New Road. New Road is not a particularly heavily trafficked road anyway, but if we can reduce the number of curb cuts, that's great. Um, so toward that end, if there is any development of this back area, it would end up coming off the end of the street that we propose right here and would actually curve into this section right back in here. We've had several meetings with staff uh, leading up to this point, and uh, we did actually show at Jay's at the planner's request that um, we show a slight build out of the area over here, which we had done for staff only. And uh, it works very well with this road being able to connect in if there were ever any lots to be created back here. If there aren't any lots uh, for the foreseeable future or ever, then the road will continue to stop or, or just stop where, it, where we show it stopping right now, and there would be no necessity to be able to curve into that uh, back development area. As far as the uh, road extension and the restrictions are, are concerned, we're absolutely fine with that. Um, there was a, a note to provide a plan stating that the remaining land is to be exclusively accessed from that proposed right away, and we have no issues with that whatsoever. We certainly put that on the, on the final plan. Um, Moving on, we talk, Jamel talked about uh, the 75-foot buffer. We do show a 75-foot, the, the stream area that we're talking about is right up in here. This is the 75-foot buffer to which he was referring. Um, it is a 75-foot buffer all the way around with the exception of, the, actually, it's a 75-foot buffer all the way around, period, but there is a section of this particular lot that the buffer comes into right there. We'd be happy to absolutely restrict that area. We could even put plantings in that area. We would like to, however, not to actually pull that particular lot back because uh, lot one and then lot six are the uh, two lots on the plan that exceed one acre. And from a valuable standpoint, we'd like to be able to keep those lots where they are. But we can certainly add um, restrictions as far as any easements are concerned. So we basically get the same effect. Uh, there's no wetlands in that particular area. It's just a buffer. So we'd be happy to state that as a buffer, but we'd like to be able to keep it that way. Keeping in mind that this is just a simple six lot subdivision, uh, there's not really a whole lot to it, but nevertheless, um, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Chapmas would like to be able to keep that there. And then regarding the buffers as well, uh, I'm gonna jump ahead just a little bit and talk about what Jamel stated regarding the contiguity of the open space area. Uh, this plan, again, I'm referring to this plan back here, has got all this open space all the way around in this area um, and over in here. We're talking about just a little section right in back of this lot We'd be absolutely happy to restrict that. Uh, for those of you who are still looking, that's this lot right back in here. We'd be happy to restrict that, but there again, from an economic standpoint, given that we are looking at a relatively long road, although certainly within the municipal guidelines, for only six lots out here, 
Um, this, this is one of the two lots that are one over one acre, and we'd like to be able to keep it that way. But again, we can certainly restrict it in terms of, uh, of an easement, uh, stating that there would be you know, no cutting and a specific buffer back here. The other thing I'd like to point out as far as contiguity is concerned is that there are wetlands on either side, up in this area and in this particular area. Um, so if we do a buffer back here, it kind of opens up the open space to anybody within this development who would like to go there. Uh, which is town practice. That's fine, but in this particular case, I think we'd like to try to discourage free people from walking through the actual wetland areas. Toward that end, that also serves by coincidence to be able to um, not isolate because it's all still connected with the overall open space throughout the entire development, um, but it keeps this <coughs> section right here free from anybody literally traversing across the stream and wandering through those wetland areas toward that end. And we still get the same thing as an end result. Uh, we can certainly restrict it toward that end so nobody can do any buffering back there. They can't do any cutting. Um, it would be left in its natural state. Um, as far as the, uh, uh, the reduction, or excuse me, the, uh, the street width uh, reduction from 22 feet to 20 feet, uh, we've met with staff on that as well and uh, several times and with the DEP. Uh, given that it is in the Redbrook watershed, uh, while it's not a huge uh, amount of space, uh, we have designed everything specifically to be able to keep the impacted area and the impervious area as absolute minimal as possible in this particular area. We are allowed to be able to go down to 20 feet, but we do need, as far as the uh, road width is concerned, but we do need the plan board's uh, approval to do that. The standard would be then uh, 22 feet. Uh, again, we narrowed it down by two feet, uh, not only working with staff, but with the DEP that was particularly adamant about doing that if possible. Uh, primarily, again, because we don't want to add any additional impervious surface area if indeed we don't need it. Um, so toward that end, uh, we would request that particular uh, waiver from 22 feet to 20 feet for the actual roadway. There was a comment under the uh, remaining elements for consideration by the board regarding the aquifer protection overlay. That typically, as far as the regulation is concerned, that typically means that you don't want any engineered systems, fully engineered systems uh, for septic above an aquifer. Uh, that basically means any system that is going to be two, under 2,000 gallons uh, a day does not really qualify for that, doesn't produce enough uh, to make any issues. Fully engineered systems are those which would be you know, for hotels or something to that effect that would produce one heck of a lot of water, uh, gray water more than that. Um, these are individual septic systems that don't come anywhere close to that. Uh, so these systems would be designed upwards of, uh, to get to up to 2,000 gallons today for a four or five bedroom house the likes of which are at the maximum likely to go in there. Some of those houses are probably not going to be that large. The point is, as far as the overlay is concerned, there's no issues toward that end because we're restricting the uh, septic systems in size. As far as the subdivision elements are concerned, some of these, uh, as Jamel went through this, uh, he was also very good at taking the uh, uh, reviewing engineer's comments and basically putting them into staff comments. I'll brief very quickly over the uh, engineer comments here in a moment, but just to continue under subdivision elements, um, we were talking about sidewalks. Rachel, I know you, you like sidewalks everywhere. Um, I certainly respect that. Uh, in this particular case, I would like to make the argument against a sidewalk for several different reasons. First of all, it's a relatively long road. I say relatively because it's still within the uh, uh, minimum or the maximum, not exceeding the maximum for the length for the municipality, so we're not asking any waiver for that. But we have six lots at the very end of this road. The point being is that nobody's really gonna be going down this road unless they live there. Uh, the road, I don't think, or the area doesn't necessarily need sidewalks. And again, because of that, we initially considered that, uh, but then when we met with staff and more particularly with the DEP regarding Redbrook, they said minimize everything as far as impervious surface area to the extent it's absolutely feasible. So toward that end, if this were a 15 lot subdivision or even a little bit smaller than that, I would agree we should put a sidewalk in there. In this case, because of six lots at the end of a road, and trying to keep the uh, impact down as absolutely low as possible in the watershed. We just don't think that a sidewalk is actually necessary toward that end. Um, given the uh, uh, minimum, oh, excuse me, um, so we've got the 25-foot uh, the buffer from the wetlands. Uh, we will, there's actually already a 25-foot buffer that's on here, but we can darken that line just to be able to show where that is. That buffer, by the way, follows all the way along this section. Um, and comes all the way up here, and then this whole thing obviously doesn't need a buffer here or here. It's just along this section. Um, so it's already there, but we can certainly darken those lines and call those out. That's absolutely no issue. 
there was a uh, um, comment about a, uh, a trail system, typically for passive recreation. Uh, this whole area is open space, so there are people that are invited basically to take advantage of that open space to the extent that they don't impugn on the wetlands area, and most people aren't going to go wandering through wetlands, but we certainly would not want to encourage that. Um, if a, uh, if a, like a mulched path, uh, if the board's pension is to have a mulchway path in lieu of a sidewalk, for instance, we can certainly do that. Again, in this particular area that would come right along back in here. Um, this, so starting from a point here, for instance, and coming back along this section and then all the way back down here again, uh, that's over a half a mile of, uh, of trails that should be or trails and then uh, coming down the, the end of the road right here. Uh, that should be quite adequate, I would think, for anybody who's out there walking, jogging, strolling, what have you. Uh, it's not necessary. I don't think it would be the typical woods path, the, the mulch, bark mulch path that a lot of us have seen. Uh, if the area is going to be uh, open in that particular section anyway, um, so I wouldn't necessarily advocate uh, cutting trees to be able to put in trails, let them, you know, the trails kind of take over themselves and, and encourage people to walk back there to the extent that they would like to. If the board feels a pension to have a, a wood chip path there, back there, we can do that, again, in lieu of the sidewalk. I think it will be a, a natural area for people to want to walk, but that's completely up to the board. Um, and we'd be happy to do with, uh, what you wish in, toward, in that degree. Um, and again, we just want to keep uh, impacts to the site absolutely minimal. Stormwater management. Uh, we are okay with uh, every single one of the project, or it's one of the, uh, the comments that's on here. Most of them are just comments. Uh, Catch basins required, for instance, to be at binder grade. That's absolutely true. We're not going to put a catch basin higher than that. Binder grade is the, the, uh, essentially the, the top coat that we're going to be looking at. So we're not going to go below that to cause a bump, and we're not going to go above it to do the same thing. So we'll certainly do that. Uh, slip form curbing, absolutely no problem. Um, the 15-inch uh, culverts at the wetlands, yes, that's just a comment. Yes, they are, they are there. Uh, and we will provide uh, the standard notes on the, uh, the final subdivision plan as provided by staff. Um, stormwater modeling shows an increase in peak flow rates at the 210 and 25 year storm events. They're minor, but there is a slight increase. Uh, keeping in mind that we're at the very head of the Red Brook watershed, and below us there, there's virtually nothing for quite a while, almost a, a little over a quarter of a mile before we have the, uh, um, the next actual um, uh, built out lot. So I don't think that we're looking at, well, we're looking at very minor increases. We can certainly go over that with staff to the extent that they would like to see the hydrocad calculations toward that end, uh, but we don't think that that's going to be uh, any issues. Again, we certainly leave that to the board and we're happy to, to go over all the uh, calculations with staff if you wish. Uh, embedded culverts, that's absolutely fine. Basically what that means is that when we've got a certain culvert, we want to be able to let the, the bottom of the chain food chain beasts be able to walk through those culverts or hop or crawl or whatever it might be uh, without actually crawling on the metal. So it's pretty standard practice nowadays to actually sink those culvert culverts uh, into the ground a bit to be able to have an organic layer within a mud a bottom basically uh, within those culverts to allow those animals to be able and insects to be able to go back and forth. No issues. Uh, we don't have any problem with that whatsoever. It's fairly standard. Uh, Pre-application meeting with the DEP, that was actually about uh, five months ago, um, but we will certainly uh, work with staff and obviously our, the general contractors who are out here know that they have to come to a, uh, uh, a pre-construction meeting with staff before they can do anything as far as the uh, applications for building permit are concerned. And then there, the final comments are just under other. Um, again, uh, we should provide a homeowners association document. The stamp, uh, plan should be stamped by a professional engineer, et cetera. We agree with every one of those comments. They're, they're just comments. That's absolutely no issue. Relatively minor project. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions or address any comments. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Um, we do have an opportunity for public comment. If there's anyone here that wanted to get up and speak, please approach the podium, state your name, and whatever comments you have. Seeing none. All right, I'll close public comment. Uh, Roger, do you want to start this one? Well, I think um, pretty much ans answered most of the questions or uh, the points I was going to bring up. Um, I, I, I tend to agree with you on the sidewalk. Um, I, I don't see a necessity to have a sidewalk there. Are you suggesting or uh, thinking about in lieu of a sidewalk having a path, or is that just... Yes, basically, it's, uh, I mean, we like to be able to, particularly because of the watershed aspect of this and the creation of additional impervious surface areas that we don't actually have to have, 
i.e., we would like a narrower road, we'd like not to have the sidewalk along the road. The answer to your question is, we'd love that to be just literally a natural path uh, toward the end, but if the, in order to be able to promote people using it, um, if the board would like to be able to have the wood chip path, which is common for a development, or not uncommon, certainly for a development in this case, in lieu of the sidewalk, then we would be amenable to that. When you get into doing something like that, do you have to um, accommodate ADA requirements when you accommodate start, what? when you start to do a path like that with wood chips? Do you have to uh, accommodate ADA? No. No. Okay. No. All right. Um, the only other question I have, and um, I don't know if this pr is pertinent, but a couple of years ago we had the uh, Grandin project. Do you recall that? Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe maybe the owners of the property might recall. Would this would this extension this so-called paper street would that do you know whether that would have any possibility of connecting with the Grandin? If you recall the Grandin property when they first proposed it, I don't know if that's a dead that's dead or what it is. That was off of uh, across from the um, Nonsuch Golf Course. Mm -hmm. It was going to go in, and then they they had shown that they were going to have a connection. And I was just wondering if this property was near the end of where they were thinking about connecting up to New Road. Um, they were going to connect to um, uh, I'm Brooke, sorry, right? Running Hill Road yeah, and Gorm Road. Road. They were right. actually oh, weren't going to have a yeah. connection out to New Road. So oh, okay. the, the the Grandin property you're talking about. I'm sorry, I was trying to place it, yeah, but yeah. now now I recall is across New Road, um, in between New Road and the Turnpike, essentially. So, okay, so yeah. it wouldn't it wouldn't okay. No, all right. Yeah. Um, I, I guess I'm all set. Thank you, Roger. Rick. I think I'm all right with a 20 foot road given the point you made about the the watershed and anything so I, I would be supportive of the 24 versus 22 or, or 20 versus the uh, 24 or 22 that's just my tidbit thank you Rick uh, Rick Dupere. Uh I'd just like to comment on the fact that you did an excellent job of answering all the questions that I had <coughs> um, and answering most of the questions that I saw in the documentation, so good job. And um, I also agree that the sidewalk, because it's the end of the road, isn't doesn't make sense, especially in the watershed. That's all I have. Thank you, Rachel. Well, the gauntlet has been thrown down. <laughs> um, let me ask you a question: uh, Is the school bus going to be going down this road? It could. Uh, for what grades? Uh, ostensibly for all grades. If they, I'm not sure exactly how the school system works that way in terms of minimums. Um, it's, a pub, it's going to be a public road, so they could. Whether it does or not, as I understand, is really up to the, the uh, school board. Yeah, that, and the, there's the concern I have in terms of sidewalks, and that's the children walking down the street. Um, on the road I live on, which is a dead end, um, it's a broad road. Uh, it's fairly clear and, uh, and open. There are no sidewalks. The school bus comes down for, um, I believe, grades kindergarten through second grade. And the rest of the children walk up the road to the connecting road because there are no sidewalks. And I watch the cars of people heading for work on our road knowing that there are children uh, exceeding the speed limit, and we've we've complained before. The children have no choice because there are no sidewalks, uh, and that becomes my concern. Not that somebody uh, might want to walk up to visit, but that children, especially um, in the winter when the roads get a little narrower, uh, either the parents are going to be driving down and waiting in their cars at the end of the road which happens on my street, um, or you're going to have certainly the high school kids are most likely to be the ones who are going to be walking down the road in the middle of the street uh, with no sidewalks. So for me, a sidewalk is a combination of an amenity and a safety issue for children. It is a place for um, young parents to wheel their carriages without wondering if a delivery truck is going to come fast around the corner to get up to some house on that road uh, as somebody's walking down with a carriage. 
it is, um, as I said, it is a safety concern. Uh, I would like to see a sidewalk on one side of the road. I am open to what that would look like, but I think in terms of safety for the children, um, and let's face it, the ordinance uh, is there uh, requesting sidewalks with good reason um, as a place for people to stroll without worrying about cars entering or exiting and for children who might be dashing around uh, to find a place to walk down without parents worrying if their kid is going to get hit on the street. So I would request that the sidewalk go in. Um, I echo what uh, Rick said. I think you answered just about everything. I was just kind of checking as I went along and just got to the, just got to the sidewalk and said, whoops. Um, so I appreciate the extra work that you've done there, but uh, as I said, uh, and answering all of these questions, but as I said, the sidewalk is also a safety concern. Uh, and I'm pretty sure the school will not send the bus down for all grade levels. Thank you. Robin. Yeah, so I would agree with Rachel in that you add um, no sidewalks is compounded by narrow streets and you have a safety concern. And let's, let's admit, I'm usually the person who's, who's screaming minimize impervious area, but I think what's missing is you have to minimize impacts to impervious area. You can still have a 22 foot road and a sidewalk and minimize impacts to impervious area. So I think therein lies the challenge. Um, it, therein lies the challenge also with um, then you go up to 22 feet and you add a sidewalk and now your stormwater, which is already exceeding pre-construction, um, is now going to be increased even more. And I'm, I, I don't necessarily agree with your comment that, oh, we're at the headwaters, so everything will be taken care of downstream kind of a thing. Um, it's these aggregate impacts that happen. There's nobody downstream for now. And we've seen it happen over and over and over again in Scarborough where, oh, it's no big deal right now. We'll let others take care of it until finally um, when the last person comes in and there's flooding issues and then people say, well, why are we making the last person in take care of the flooding issues? We've got to take care of it now. You've got to meet the current standards and make sure that post-construction is less than or equal to pre-construction. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Um, I think it's a DEP requirement. It's a town ordinance requirement. Um, and so I really appreciate you saying that you agree with all of the stormwater management bullets, and does that include the open bottom culvert? Yes. Perfect. Well, uh, it includes a culvert that will have the natural bottom to it. It may be a closed culvert that's buried one quarter. Embedded culvert or open bottom culvert? There's two, there are two different things. They are two different things. Um, right now, it's shown as an embedded culvert. Mm -hmm. um, it could be open bottom, but the embedded culvert will have, it's typically they're embedded by, well, you know the drill. They, they go three quarters of the way of open mm -hmm. and then one quarter is typically mm -hmm. embedded mm -hmm. um, so that it's literally below grade and the grade continues right on through there. Because so I'm not convinced that a 15 inch culvert is necessarily enough kind of a thing. And I well, think that's the point that's, okay, that staff was making is that stormwater management design does need to um, need some, some, some finesse thing. And um, I think it's really important that we work together to make sure that we are um, considering all, um, you know, the options here in, in addition to sort of making this economically feasible for the landowner as well as, you know, um, accomplishing what we need to in the Red Brook watershed, and that is, you know, the ultimate protection, making sure that we have st stormwater quantity and quality protection. Um, and, and so a couple other questions I have is, are you measuring the, the, the buffer setbacks from the center line of the stream or from the edge of the stream? From the edge. From the edge of the stream. Both the 75-foot from the stream and the 25 foot from the wetland kind of yes. a thing is, is yep. the edge. That's the way it's and how, to be done. Okay, and so will there be covenants or deed, you know, or some type of deed restriction associated with those lots that say that there will be no? Yes. And, um, that will be in the homeowners association document. Okay, and if you do decide to do a trail instead of a sidewalk or something like that, will those be built at the same time as the road? 
or will those be built like when you do each site, you know, each site um, individually kind of a thing? Because I think that that's the difference too between a path and a sidewalk. A sidewalk, you come in and put the infrastructure all in versus, oh, we'll do that trail or path when each lot gets sold and developed. And I, I sure. just would hate us to miss the mark on that. I absolutely concur. And given that this is only six, this is not going to be a phased development, there's only six lots. Okay. And so construction is essentially all at the same time. Okay. Now that doesn't mean that I mean, the path may, may be after the road is already in, yeah. but again, it's no, there's no phasing. So when we do the construction, that would be part of it. Okay. Um, is there still an opportunity? Um, have you had the? I, I know that the pre-application meeting is over, but will there be other meetings with the DEP? Um, I, I would expect the DEP permit back any time, essentially. So there may be if they request it, but okay. otherwise, no. Um, if they do request it, please please include the town engineer. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, So I guess I just want to reiterate the difference between minimizing impervious area and minimizing impacts of impervious area. Because I think the way it is now, if we have a 20-foot narrow road and no sidewalk, I I'm com I'm completely agree with, with Rachel that it's a recipe for disaster and danger with respect to pedestrians. And um, I'll also tell you that public safety trumps the environment any old Day of the week, as as far as um, you know, being a realist is concerned. So, I don't know what, Mr. Chair, you would like from us as far as talking about the sidewalk and the width of the road, kind of a thing. But I think we definitely have a few different differing opinions. Um, last, before I hand it back over to you, I'm not. I, I also need clarification on the aquifer protection overlay zone. Um, I think. What you're saying is that you, you're not putting any engineered systems in, so that's a good thing? I, I guess, can you just clarify what's going on with your septic and making sure that you have the right spacing, but also considering aquifer protection overlay requirements? Yes. Basically, what, the, uh, what that means is that there's an aquifer here, and it's deep. But nevertheless, you don't want to have, you meaning anybody doesn't want something going in, filtering through and going into that aquifer that wouldn't be basically natural. So mm -hmm. toward that, and uh, septic systems. So essentially what happens is, and the regulation refers to the overlay district as, if there was anything of an industrial character mm -hmm. that would end up going in there, and an engineered system means right now there's a basic septic system that a soil scientist, a registered, uh, I mean, licensed soil scientist can create, can design. Mm -hmm. And that would go in for any residential property. That typically can go up to 2,000 gallons a day, which far exceeds what most people would use for residences. Uh, and only really exceeds that if you end up getting a lot of internal water usage somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, if you had a, a car wash yeah. uh, that would actually be out in the middle of nowhere and wants to fed everything into it. What additional system. protections do you need to put in for your septic system? We don't. Order? We don't? No. Nope. Not for residential. Not in that overlay district. Mm. Okay. There are protections for um, when it comes to single family with regards to the type of um, uh, if there's going to be an oil tank, the type of oil tanks that are used, where the lines are placed, whether they're embedded in the cement in the foundation or they're above. So they're, they're those type okay. of um, elements that really get picked up through our code enforcement officers as part of their uh, building permit process. Um, Great. Yeah, and I apologize. I didn't go back to the aquifer protection overlay language myself. Usually I do. And I'm, I guess I'm just surprised that we don't have additional septic protections in there for the aquifer. Well, you do, or the, the, we do, the town does, mm -hmm. when it gets over a certain threshold. Got it, okay. And we're not even close to mm. approaching that. Okay. I guess I'm set, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, if you do get a moment, I'd like to come back to Rachel's, a couple of Rachel's comments. Sure, yeah. I'm going to try to help um, probably frame up some of this discussion so we can kind of clarify some things. Thank you. Because um, I, I don't think you're quite ready for a preliminary this evening. I think there's some touch-up plans that you have to go through, um, and I think part of that is probably going to result in what our discussion here is for your marching orders and staff as well. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to start with uh, questioning you regarding this 
uh, lot number six, um, that 75 foot setback is on private property, right? And I, I hear you when you say, you know, we can, we can vegetate and buffer it and we can delineate it so no one ever goes in there and yada yada. So as a homeowner, what, why is it important to me to own an acre but I can't use that portion of it? I would just prefer to see it off of the private property if possible. My question for you though is, would you lose the frontage? Do you have enough necessary frontage if you were to stick the property boundary to that 75 foot setback line? I believe we would have enough frontage. You would? Yes. Okay. Um, I also think that you might be able to make up that acreage in the back corner. If you followed a property line out the back, not that I want to write this thing for you, I still think you might be able to get that acre just by moving that back boundary line maybe a little bit out, still keep your, still get that acre you desire. So um, for what it's worth, as a homeowner, somebody's going to purchase this, you know, you can tell me I have an acre of land, but if I can't use a sliver of it because it's buffered and all this other stuff, it doesn't, at that point I'm saying, well, why don't you just sell me 0.8? So just my thoughts on that. Um, lot one, and I know um, staff has indicated that they would prefer to see some sort of um, connectivity officially there. I'm, I'm okay, considering what the layout is, we have wetlands on both sides of it, I'm okay with kind of an easement buffer strip back there. So you win one, you lose one. <laughs> um, in my book, at least, and I'm only one vote, just remember that. Um, the other thing is on your proposed roadway width, um, you know, given that you want to turn this over to the town, and if the town is saying we want 22 feet, I think I think you deserve it to give them the 22 feet width, um, just because they're the ones that end up maintaining it. Um, that's that's my opinion. Uh, and then as far as sidewalks, I was uh, I was relaying the story uh, just just the other day on this. I live in a neighborhood that has 47 homes. It's not small. We have zero sidewalks. Um, and we manage plenty fine. Um, and I'm gonna tell you something, kids will play in the street whether you have a sidewalk or not. So um, I'm going with six lots here. I don't believe you need a sidewalk considering the um, sensitive nature of some of the water features you do have on this parcel. I would, I would be okay with not seeing sidewalks. However, I do believe that it would be important though to make a contribution to an intermodal account so sidewalks I mean, if, you, if this second par parcel ever did get developed and you had to extend this roadway out, you might be looking at more than six lots. You might be more looking at, you know, six, seven, eight more in there. All of a sudden, maybe the need for a sidewalk arises 15 years down the road. So I, I would prefer some sort of contribution in lieu of building those out to be made. And if the time ever came and it became an issue on that road, the town would have your early contribution into making that happen on the property. So those are my thoughts for the board to consider as well. Um, I think we need to provide the applicant some clear direction and staff as well um, as to how we approach um, road width, sidewalks, um, the setback. Stormwater, I think, is technically going to have to be um, hammered out with Angela a little bit further and staff. So. Um, so to that end, let's um, let's talk road width because that seems to be yes, Roger. Um, well, I think the road width ties in with the sidewalk to some degree, mm -hmm. <coughs> and um, <clears throat> I would agree with with you on the. Yeah, I mean, if the town really wants the 22 foot, um, I could go along with that. Regarding the sidewalks, I live in a neighborhood that's actually larger than yours, that has no sidewalks, and I what I and kids walk to school, I mean, they walk up and down the street to get the bus and everything. And what I find is that the people who live in the neighborhood know, they know when the kids are going to get the bus and they drive more carefully um, during that period of time. So I, I, I don't necessarily think a sidewalk, especially on this property, is warranted. Um, so, but I, I, I don't have a problem with the 22 foot if that's what the town really insists on, on having, so. Hi, Angela. Can I speak to that? Yeah. Yes, you may. <laughs> <laughs> um, looking at the width, I think one of the pinch points is really that crossing where there's guardrail um, is really the issue concern. I think in the past um, we have found where you have kind of obstructions on both sides and you get to 20 feet, and that t I guess could speak to also walking, although you're beyond, I guess, all the lots. but. It, 
in that respect, um, Public Works has an issue with trying to maintain and plow a 10-foot travel way with a hard obstruction along that side. So in that case where the guardrail is, there's a curb and guardrail on one side, which really hinders that um, plow. And then on the other side, there is a gap. Um, so it was really trying to figure out that cross section a little better. Um, once you get past that, I think it opens up and you have a shoulder, which gives you some flexibility, I think, with plowing. But really, it was it's really speaking to that pinch point, and that's where it kind of comes back to, I guess, Robin's comment about being realistic is the environment is important, but we also need to be able to maintain this road. Um, and so I think that's where I just wanted to point out the issue that we had. About the width. Yeah, about the width. And so the 22 is what we have found typically works. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So if we could, as a, um, before we get into it, if the applicant wanted to I saw that you wanted to jump in at one point and maybe give a little feedback before we deliberate on those topics. And I think we as a board will take them issue by issue with right. sidewalk and then some lot line work. Okay. I think and if anyone here thinks I've missed one of the big ones, let me know. Okay, go no, ahead. I think we've covered everything. Please. So um, as far as the, the road width is concerned, I know that all of us were not here when we first approached this subject or this, this project a couple of years ago, uh, several years ago. Um, in working with the town and then working with the staff at that time when we had the uh, uh, pre-application meetings with both the town and the staff, we actually, re we originally had a 22-foot wide road. And the push was because of the Red Brook watershed, we wanted to narrow the impact as much as possible. So 22 feet being, actually 24 feet being a standard, but 22 feet being allowed, we wanted to go with the 22 feet and the issue was you can narrow it up further than that and still receive your same ends. So we've been designing this only on this project. We've had been here many of the times on other projects where there haven't been any issues. We're getting kind of conflicting advice from the same sources. And I think that's feet. what I tried to clarify, to say there's really that pinch point that was not there before. When you start talking about, I'm sorry, the 20-foot travel way, and then having shoulders, and then having grading off the side, it's very different than having a 20-foot wide plus hard stop And where, that, uh, where those guardrails are um, is a one-to-one -one stabilized slope, so it's, which is typically steep, which is fine, still works with riprap to be able to stabilize it, but it's typically not what we would normally do for a road. Normally roads are graded out at three to one or two to one. This is a one-to-one -one because we took that advice from both the state and from the town at the time and we pushed it as narrow as we could get it. And now we're kind of going back the other direction. And this is kind of throwing us a little bit for a loop at this stage. But if you've had to go smaller, then we shouldn't be seeing you not meet the 210 and 25. Do you see what I'm saying? Like by saying go smaller, then your stormwater should have been sized properly. And so I guess I see it as being you can't, you can't have your cake and eat it. No, too, it still kind sides of properly. Okay. If, if we were to go larger, we'd end yep. up having a greater impact toward that end. Right. So the smaller we get, I mean, there's a certain point where we can't go any smaller. Right. We're basically there. Um, so there's going to be an increase in this area no matter what we do as far as impervious surface areas. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, we can't have anything post-construction that exceeds right. pre-construction. So toward that end, off-site. So toward that end, we've minimized that impact absolutely to the greatest extent feasible. We can't get any narrower than we already okay. are. And now we're being asked to go wider. And down, so now the impacts for downstream as well as on site are going to be greater. And we had this conversation earlier, albeit much earlier as far as the board was concerned, but not that long ago again with the DEP. And they were like, because of the classification of Red Brook, they're like, like making it safety wise, obviously taking into consideration, making it as narrow as possible. And within the right of way, there's not a problem as far as sidewalks. We're not against sidewalks. Um, and as, uh, as Rachel mentions, from a safety perspective, that's great. But I think in this particular case, given the size of the development that we're looking at, those sidewalks are not necessary. And as far as road width is concerned, we're trying to max or minimize everything as possible to make all parties happy. And if we start going the other direction, now we're kind of going against the feedback that we've had for the past couple of years. Can I ask a quick question here from Angela or the applicant? This pinch point, I is imagine this that curve, correct? Right down here. Is that yes. Not accurate? Is there a way that you broaden that 
area out so they can make their turns comfortably but leave the rest of the road at the 20 foot and them and public work still be satisfied is that even possible or has it been explored well the curb would remain the same so that's the not right. it's the guardrails so it was the town asking him to remove guardrails i think uh, no <laughs> I think if you're looking at, I'm looking at the cross section, and I'm, what we're talking about is two feet at a pinch point is what is needed. And then you get back into a cross section, which is really, um, has those shoulders. It's really about the size of the plow. It's the width of the plow and trying to get through there and trying to maneuver and trying to wing back. And really what is being proposed is going to be extremely difficult and we're talking about sending a separate piece of equipment out to a remote location to plow this street and i think that is a concern or should be a concern for the town and that's where public works i think is weighing in is making sure that as they're doing gorham road or new road that they can get into these subdivisions and out uh, angela i'm not sure i understand what you're saying that the uh from a plowing perspective, mm -hmm. the pinch point on the curve? No, not the curve. The guard, oh, where the, the guard guardrail rails. sections are. Yes, right. where you don't have, you don't have 22 feet. Um, in the sections beyond that, you have 22 feet wide that the plow can actually operate in, and then it drops down from there. Mm -hmm. Not a fixed object at 20 feet. It, there's a big difference just having that leeway and that they're not going to be ripping out guardrail or ripping out curb at the wetland crossings because that will ultimately would be what kind of happens through there <laughs> if they try to go in there with a large piece of equipment. Um, I guess the guardrail I can understand. I mean, the curb is, I mean, most roads are curved. So that's, the plows are just going to have to deal with the curbs. I mean, unless you don't want to curb, but I wouldn't suggest that. Well, this isn't all curbed, right? Your, Correct. Your grading shows that you are grading into swales. Yes. Yeah, so if we don't, if, if, if the, I guess if the problem is with DPW is the ability to be able to get a plow in there, I just, other than the guardrail being very close to the edge of the road, because we don't want anybody going off the road toward that end, um, I'm not really sure that any curbing would have any effect on a plow. Again, you're not showing a shoulder. So the travel, and I'm so, sorry, we can yeah, stop this So what I'm gonna say at this point is, I think this is evidence of, <laughs> I think the applicant needing to spend more time with the, you know, the public works and Angela and engineering to come back with the roadway design that they can agree upon. Because you might be able to get away with 20 feet for 75% of this road and we could all be satisfied, but you gotta figure out a way around this pitch point. And for, for them to be able to service the road, if you want this to be public and the town to take care of it, I think you got to get to that. So um, for that topic, uh, anyone on this board can say otherwise, but I'm going to say I think you need to go back to the town and try to work through it so we can see it again. Um, us arbitrarily telling you 24 feet today is not going to help you, or 22 feet is not going to help you. I think you got to work this out. So um, I'm going to move us on to sidewalks. All right, let's... Um, we have to figure out sidewalks. Uh, one sidewalk, no sidewalk, all sidewalked. How do you guys feel? Yes, Roger. No sidewalk. No sidewalks for Roger. Rick? No sidewalk for contribution to the fund. Rick? No sidewalk contribution. Okay. Rachel? Sidewalk. Robin? Uh, can you do, can we do one sidewalk and a contribution? <laughs> <laughs> We could try. <laughs> I mean, I, I believe sidewalk on both sides is the, is the general norm, correct? Not necessarily in Not the necessarily. RF district. Oh, no, I would no, say RF when we're talking right. in okay. other, in our in-town in districts, ER4, okay. TVCs, I think it's a different design okay. expectation. The RF. I'll just leave it at sidewalk. Yeah, sidewalk. Mm -hmm. All right. I say uh, no sidewalk contribution. So. Uh, of voting members, I've got Roger, Rick, me, Rachel, Robin. So I've got three no sidewalks, two yes sidewalks. So um, three no sidewalks plus a fee. Plus the fee. Yep. Okay. Roger, you you're in with the fee. Yeah. Thank you. So there's your answer to that one okay. for now. And then the yeah, last item is this lot line trying to keep out of that 75 foot stream buffer. 
Um, does anyone else feel strongly about this as I do? Um, and please feel free to disagree. I know you have in the past. Rick, yes. I feel the same. Okay. I think if it's on, if it's on someone's lot, be better than that, not on. Okay. Robin, Rachel, see some nodding Green. heads. Roger. So what you're proposing is uh, on lot six is um, kind of squaring off that back portion to I, pick up the to Yeah, pick up the I'd area. be asking him to try to move that property line along that 75-foot setback and then have him extend out the back edge of that property just so he can keep his one acre. I was throwing it out as an option if you needed to keep the one acre. Does that but seem feasible? Um, I appreciate the comment. Anything is feasible, <laughs> but uh, okay, do it then. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let me caveat that. <laughs> you know, if that's the pension of the board, to be sure. But keep in mind that the 75-foot setback is not going to prevent anybody from going there. This is all open space, so everybody, everybody, anybody who might be in this division who might have a pension to walk there is going to do so. Um, by simply restricting it with the configuration of the, of the uh, lot that we've got right now. When restricting the build, building envelope and then putting it in the covenants, and we can, <coughs> as we've done this with the board before, um, we can put a, uh, a permanent structure there on that lot, i.e., a split rail fence, stones, I mean, big rocks, not little tiny stones, etc., um, to make sure that uh, you know it's not that nobody puts anything there as far as the building, and nobody builds a shed there. In other words, other than that, though, it's just open space anyway. So I'm not really sure what that's going to do that it doesn't already do, because we are preserving that area. I'd also like to point out that it could affect the size of Lot 1, um, so you may want to discuss that as well. The 75 foot, it's not just Lot 6. Nick? Uh, where's the line for Lot 1? So the stream's there. So um, it's presumably, I think that's right considerably further. Oh, I see. Yeah. So it could impact Lot 1. I if you carried on that buffer. By, yeah, you're right, by a couple of feet. Literally, there's a tiny arc right up there that follows that 75 foot line. Um, I mean, we can adjust that out. We just tried to keep the line simple, but we can certainly adjust that out if that's necessary. Okay. I'm uh, not sure it's going to do any good, but Robin, we can do it. Who, who will maintain ownership of the open space in this instance? Homeowners Association. All right, so um, 75 foot buffer. Yes, Roger. Um, let, let me ask on, on lot six, did you consider doing what Nick suggests before you laid out the, the lot lines the way it is now? Yeah, and and we, if you didn't, why didn't you? No, the whole purpose of that was to try to keep as much of the space beyond and back of the lots as possible. Uh, and basically a uniform width, which is essentially what you see all the way around here, all the mm -hmm. way until you get down to actually the wetland areas down at the bottom. So everything is wide enough because we wanted to be able to promote people to use the open space passively as recreation, whether it be a walkway or just go in there and toss a frisbee or something like that. Um, it is a fairly wooded area, but it's not jungle wooded. Uh, the point being is we wanted to maintain that uniformity of a fair width to be able to encourage people to be able to, or not discourage people from going there as opposed to making it really, really narrow. Well, we could. I mean, it's, it's the open space that we can trade. If we need to trade for the 75 feet, we can. Again, I'm just not sure what it's going to do, because that 75-foot area is still going to be preserved. But, again, anything is feasible. I, I suggest that we do what you're saying, Nick, and think about redrafting those lines outside of the 70-foot setback and put the as proposed by the applicant to put the structural barriers there, like a rock or something like that. And I'm also concerned about um, construction, making sure like at a pre-construction meeting that it's very much, and maybe Angela and, and Jamel can talk about whether this is something that's discussed routinely at pre-construction meetings is making sure that <laughs> that those buffers, whether it's the 75 foot buffer or the 25 foot buffer are not encroached upon as far as um, deforestation and devegetation, you know, and, and those types of things. Are they, are they mentioned in pre-construction meetings? Well, the, the plan in the past, the board has asked for hardscape features to be placed there as boulders or fences. Um, and that becomes a requirement. Um, and that's that, before construction takes place? Correct. Perfect, okay. 
Rachel, do you want to weigh in on this? I, I go along with you, Nick. I think um, if that property is pulled out, I, I think it's, it's psychological. People think they have X amount of land and they find out, well, they have X minus in terms of use. Um, and uh, we've seen that over the years what, what happens is people kind of forget that that area uh, is not exactly theirs, although it's maybe on their boundary survey. So be better to do it now, cut it off now. All right, so I, I, you know, I think we ask that you go ahead and um, look at that again. Sure. And then uh, work out with the town what you can, and then we'll see you back here in hopefully three weeks. All right. Any other questions for this board? Um, not at this time. Thank you, Jim. All right. Thank you. Item number eight, Maine Life Care Retirement Community Inc. requests a final site plan and subdivision review for five Dorado Drive, Assessor's Map, R91, Lot 1D. Jamil. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so this is located in a contract zone, um, the RF zoning district off of Dorado Drive. Uh, so as the board may recall, the applicant um, is proposing a new senior independent living campus uh, that includes 16 duplex units, a mixed-use commons building, and eight single-family homes. The applicant's also proposing a public trailhead um, and a 12.5-acre conservation easement um, at the rear portion of the property. Uh, so staff would like to note that the town council approved the contract zone amendment uh, in June, and the applicant uh, included the recorded agreement uh, with their submission materials. During the council's deliberation, uh, they asked the board to have a discussion with the applicant about a handful of items, um, such as uh, the proposed berm and plantings along Newcomb Ridge Road, the dimming of light fixtures, the height of the commons building, uh, wayfinding signage for the public trailhead, and a designation of a project contact uh, for potential concerns during the construction process. So the applicant is still proposing a sidewalk, or a crosswalk rather, across Spurwink Road. Um, and given that the crosswalk is still subject to Maine DOT approval, uh, staff has provided the board with conditions of approval uh, in case DOT does not approve uh, the crosswalk as noted on the plan. The contract zone agreement does require a groundwater and monitoring plan to be reviewed and approved by the board uh, to ensure the project does not adversely impact uh, water quality and flow of existing wells within a thousand feet of the project. Uh, the applicant has not provided this report with the submission, uh, but staff did uh, provide a condition of approval requiring board approval of this element at a future meeting prior to the start of construction on the site. The staff recommends that the board and the applicant have a discussion about the proposed lighting on the site, uh, specifically about the proposed brightness of the fixtures and an appropriate time to dim the lights uh, during the evening hours. And the applicant did provide uh, responses to concerns raised by, raised by the board uh, related to traffic, wayfinding signage, and the abutters water wells. So the applicant should be sure to discuss these with the board. And staff would also like to note that uh, there were several letters uh, from the public received uh, for t this evening, and those, have, those letters have been provided to the board uh, for your consideration. And staff has provided the board with a motion t this evening with conditions uh, for the board to consider. Thank you. Thanks, Jamal. I'd like to uh, introduce the project, go over some of the bigger park points that you need from us tonight, and then we'll take it from there. Uh, thank you. Will Conley, landscape architect and project manager for Sebago Technics. Uh, representing Maine Life Care Retirement Community, doing business at Piper Shores. Um, I'm going to refer to the graphic behind you. And uh, Jamel gave an excellent introduction. One of the things that we've done is we moved the crosswalk. It previously was here. We moved it down proximate to the entrance in response to staff and your traffic peer reviews uh, previous comments. And uh, the other discussion we had the last time uh, we met with you was regarding uh, signage for the public trails. So as you approach from this direction, right about here will be a sign that will have uh, a, uh, an advanced crosswalk ahead sign, as well as a public trail parking trailhead sign. 
Similarly, coming from this direction, there'll be a sign uh, in this location uh, that would have a similar message. And then within the property, once a member of the public enters here, there'll be a sign there that says public trail parking straight, so people aren't confused and turn down this road. And then another one here, uh, same sign, continue straight for public trailhead parking so they wouldn't uh, turn here. Um, I'll be brief tonight in the interest of time. Um, regarding uh, light fixtures, um, one of the, uh, we've read the draft motion and the conditions and we're fine with all of them. One of them was uh, to uh, have a conversation with you about the time that the lights would be dimmed. Our previous proposals were for 11 p.m. Uh, and we had that position because it's important to the safety of the residents that the light fixtures function uh, on the roadways. And we thought 11 p.m. was a reasonable time. In the interest of compromise, we're now suggesting to agree to 10 p.m. And then um, regarding the abutter wells, um, we will provide a detailed plan and come back before the board, not the planning department, before this body for your review and approval uh, prior to building permit. So um, with that, I'm going to conclude my presentation and answer any questions the board may have. Thank you, Will. Uh, we have an opportunity for public comment this evening. If you would like to comment on this project, please approach the podium, state your name, and uh, we'll ask that you can keep your testimony at four minutes. I'll do a little courtesy tap if you have 30 seconds left, just to give you a heads up to try to wrap it up. Hello. Hello. My name is Rick Fox. And I just have a question on the trails. Will they be maintained by Piper Shores or by the town? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening. I'm Jeff Jones, 14 Acorn Lane. I'm going to butter to the property, my wife and Lucia and I. And I, I'd written an email, so I'm, I don't want to try to a little bit more detail than tonight, but I do want to get into there should be significantly more layering of the buffering facing the north and the west side, which is the Acorn Lane side. The people that were on the site walk with us that day, standing in the driveway where the, where the commons is going to be, my, my big yellow house, the, back, the entire back of it was clearly visible. Um, for six months of the year, that's the way it's going to be. And right now, they're just proposing grass and lawn. So they're going to have this big building on the top of the knoll and then the estate. So all, this, all these trees are going to be clear cut to, make, to wait, make way for these buildings. And then there's going to be no buffering in between. The pump house should be buffered on three sides and the street light should be eliminated. There's no reason for a 20 foot uh, pole with a street light on a pump house, which is closest to everyone's property. And um, the lighting should be, right now the lighting on the 20 foot poles is facing outward. The exterior, which is Acorn Lane, those should be on the other side of the road facing the commons and the interior so that those lights are shining down and away from the uh, neighbors. Um, so if you look at the way those, those lights are, are positioned, they're all facing, um, they're on the roadway facing towards the north, which is in the estates. Um, so that whole area of the estates is going to be, that's all trees like maples and oak trees. Those are all going to be gone. And there's been really no buffering to put in its place except just around the houses. Um, the streets and the street lights are completely um, exposed. So uh, we'd really like to see that beefed up in, in layers between the commons and the estates mm -hmm. and then the estates and acorns. So in different layers of non-deciduous trees. We already have enough oaks and maples. So during the summer months, we won't see this project. It'll be, it'll, it's only during the winter when there's no leaves on the trees that it's completely exposed. So right now I can already see my neighbor and their lights and everything. It's going to be even worse um, once this gets built. And then the last thing on the sidewalks, I know this is uh, a, a difficult issue, 
But my suggestion for a plan B, if plan A doesn't work, which is the applicants, we're going to put a crosswalk across 77, and um, the DOT is going to lower the speed limit, and all that's going to happen. That's great if it does. But if it doesn't, I don't want to see another isolated neighborhood in a community in the town. This is a $45 million project. At a minimum, they should put, be made to put sidewalks on their property along 77. If we get them from Acorn down to Ocean, then we just have one little section to connect, and this whole neighborhood and this whole community will be connected to the Higgins Beach area, which is what the comprehensive plan calls for. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, uh, David Whitaker, um, 12 Acorn Lane. Uh, by point of reference and abutting uh, to this property, I'm probably in closest proximity to the uh, pump station. I uh, just want to you know, echo what uh, Jeff had indicated in his email. I had sent one as well. Um, for point of brevity, I won't restate all those points, uh, but just really accentuate the buffering. Um, it's nowhere near enough on the north facing side. Um, Certainly welcome anyone to take a peek out of our backyards and, and you can get a point of reference, particularly with the size of the apartment complex that's going in at the highest point. Um, and further the lighting, um, 10 o'clock, while we certainly appreciate the compromise, um, that is still just far too late in our view for to have that kind of lighting. Um, given you know the neighborhood as a whole, we think um, a much earlier hour is certainly appropriate. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to get up and speak? Seeing that, I'm going to close public comment and ask the applicant to jump back up real quick. So um, <clears throat> you've seen your, your draft motion. Um, you said you agreed to it. I think uh, there were some good questions from the public, and if you wanted to take a moment to just kind of highlight uh, some of the things that you are agreeing to um, in response, directed to the chair. Yeah, well, many of them are addressed in the uh, proposed conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, um, maybe speak to the buffering um, yeah. in particular. Um, an additional row of coniferous tree plantings along the tree line to the east of the single family homes and along the rear and side of the sewer pump station be added to the plans. The elimination of a proposed 20 foot light fixture adjacent to the sewer pump station. A plan note indicating the light fixtures will be dimmed at a time discussed with the planning board. So those are in the motion. So we will have to. Correct. Revise the plans accordingly. Correct. So you are adding in extra buffering around the areas noted by the public so far. You are going to eliminate the 20-foot light post. Yeah, um, in accordance with the, the motion, yeah. Yes, and um, as far as a 10 p.m. cutoff time, uh, this board, do you find the 10 p.m. cutoff time acceptable? Rick? Yeah, can I just... Uh, sure. Is... There a reason you couldn't dim them at an earlier time? Because you're. Are you proposing shutting them off at no, 10 p.m.? No, dimming them. I oh, say so you're already just going to dim them at. At 10 p.m. Is there a lot of. You anticipate a lot of foot traffic and traffic in and out of there at a particular time? Is there a reason that you picked 10 p.m.? Other than it's. Well, we have selected 11 p.m. because. Um, while it's a elderly housing project, um, you know, there will be people that are, you know, visiting relatives and returning back to their homes, you know, at those hours. And we anticipate the need to provide safety for the residents. Right. Keep in mind that all of these fixtures are full cut off. They're not anywhere near the property line. The zero foot candle limit is reached well before the property line. So there's no spillover of light onto a budding property. So we think we've got a very responsible plan in place 
And, but like I said in my introduction, in the interest of further compromise, we proposed to dim the lights at an hour earlier than we, we originally had planned on. So our proposal is, is 10 p.m. and we're firm with that proposal. Okay. Um, you provided a photometrics plan, but I didn't see the actual, uh, am I missing the lighting cut sheets? Or were they supplied earlier? They were previously submitted. Okay. Um, okay. Are they 3,000 Kelvin lights or 4,000? Do you know what the light temperature is? Are they the 4,000 brighter white or are they 3,000? 3,000. Okay. All right. Um, I mean, there are sensors. I guess I'm okay with the. You know, there are sensors you can use to, to bring the lights up, you know that, right? So you could have a sensor that you could dim the lights at 9 o'clock and have a sensor bring them up as soon as it saw some sort of motion. But just a thought if you want to try to help them be good neighbors. But we, we think we already are. Yeah. I mean, you've, you've done a lot, so. We yeah. have. Yeah, that's all I have. Thank you. Rachel? Yeah, I'm looking at the landscape plan, um, landscape plan part four, and you've got several areas that are marked tree save in between the estates and the property, I believe, on Acorn Road. Could you describe uh, a little in a little more detail what, what you mean by tree save, what's in there now? Yeah, that's existing forest to remain in its natural state. And I, I might point out that from our property line to the homes on Acorn Lane, there's an additional considerable depth, 100 to 200 feet of additional mature forest. Now, as the res residents have said, um, they are predominantly deciduous trees. So I would agree with them that in the winter, the landscape changes. Um, but in the summer, it's, you know, it's solid. What, um, so tree save denotes undisturbed, nothing's going to get Right, so, so what's, what's currently there, you're planning on saving that. I'm looking at the outlines here, and it's pretty extensive save area. But yeah. I don't note any uh, real landscaping or buffering around the, the pump station. We're going to be adding that as a part of the condition. Okay. Uh, and, and what is it that you're going to be adding? Evergreens. Evergreens. So that should within a few years be totally screened or yes. it will be screened immediately. Tall, how tall are the evergreens you're adding? Eight to 12 feet. And eight to 12 feet and the height of the pump station? Uh, 12 to 14. So it's not gonna take long before that's fully? No. All right, thank you. That's all my well. questions. Thank you, Rachel. Robin, do you have anything? Yeah, who maintains the trails, the town or Piper Shores? Piper Shores. Um, how much glassing will you be doing? Um, well, it's, it, there, there's some in each neighborhood. There's a little bit in the pocket neighborhood. There's a fair amount for the commons building. Mm -hmm. And there's a little bit in the estates neighborhood. Okay. Um, so it's not extensive. It's not minor either. Are you doing any um, blasting monitoring other than the basic minimum? Oh, yes. Um, and you'll see, we'll bring that before you, uh, Robin. Okay. We will be doing a, a pre-blast survey within 1,000 feet of the property okay. of foundations, wells, water quality, water quantity. Is it a hydrogeologist or a hydrologist that you're going to be hiring? Um, well, our plan is tentatively to hire SW Cole. Okay, because I'd just like to note that in number eight of the... Um, contract zone amendment that was has already been approved by the town number eight should say hydrogeologist that's somebody who does groundwater and well monitoring not well motioning yeah sw kind of call has done this for Good. a number of yep years. they're fabulous i just wanted to make the the sort of the point that a hydrogeologist is very different than a hydrologist which is Pointing. what number eight says um I look forward to the blasting plan and the monitoring. Thank you, Will. You're welcome. All set. Thanks, Robin. Roger. 
I have uh, questions about buffering and the lighting. Uh, just a clarification on the lighting. Um, I suspect the people who live in the estates are going to be quite mobile and probably be going out quite often. So I would tend to agree with you that they're going to be out and about and be coming back. You know, probably going into Portland to, you know, the, the uh, you know, plays or whatever else they want to do, eat, whatever. So um, I can see them being out and about quite a bit. So I would, I could see where it's necessary to have adequate street lighting in, in particular. Um, are, the, um, are the homes in the estates as well as the duplex, are they going to be controlled or uh, uniformly controlled or are they going to be controlled individually by the Individually property? controlled. Individually. The site lighting will be uniformly controlled. The unit yeah. lighting will be controlled individually. Okay. So at 10 o'clock when you, you're going to dim the street lights at 10 o'clock, is that where you that's our proposal, yes. Okay, so how how far apart are the street lights? Are they at the intersections of the different streets, or are they going to be placed like at every? Uh, they're feet? about every one hundred feet along the streets. Okay. So they're more light fixtures than they're just like at the two intersections. Yeah. They're, okay. Because okay. they illuminate the sidewalk. Remember, there's it, they light the roadway, but the sidewalks as well. And what about like the um, the estates, the home, the lighting on the estates? How, how are you going to well in that? the pedestrian areas or the the pockets within the estates, and the pocket neighborhood, the green spaces that are at the rear of the units, those would be lit by bollards, uh, okay. three feet tall. Um, okay. Um, regarding the buffering. When I was on the sidewalk and we were looking at like the McDonald's house is where the tower, the commons is going to become located there. I don't recall what it was like behind there, which abuts up to Camp Catcher. Mm -hmm. it, it, isn't that all wooded? Um, or is that well, open space? You can, uh, referring to this graphic, this is pretty accurate. Yeah. Um, the McDonald's backyard pretty much comes up to, there's a narrow band of trees on the Dorado property. Okay. But it'll be um, it'll be cleared up to the tree line, and what's like on, it is today. And what's on the Camp Catcher property? Is that wooded or that, that? That's all wooded. Yeah, okay. that that parcel is entirely wooded. So basically, if you're putting, I'm going to give you a break here. If you're if you're putting more trees there, more buffering, you're just buffering the buffering. Well, yeah. Well, we we're not planning to do that here. Okay, so you're not planning we're, to do we're, it. We're doing that here, and we're going to be adding it in this neighborhood as well. But there's no reason the buffer can't catch it from this building. Okay, okay, that, I was going to suggest that, okay? Because um, I'm not sure. But I do think the conifer trees along, you know, separate on, on the Acorn Street side, Acorn Lane side, I think that's important. Mm -hmm. So I, I think in the... Um, in the notes here, it was the staff recommended putting some buffering behind the, the Commons building. In the motion, it says to the west and north of the Commons building. And that would be behind the building, I think. I think behind the building, one of the things that we sort of looked at is with the Commons building sitting up on the bluff, it, there's the sort of grassy knoll, if you will, um, towards the I'll call it the acorn corner, back corner of the commons building. There might be opportunity to augment some trees at the top of that hill, sort of along that parking lot area, to provide yet another layer of sort of screening from the acorn folks, if, if people can understand where I'm. You talk, are you talking about the top corner? Oh, right there? Up in this area additional screening from folks who might be looking at it from that direction. Okay, I guess I guess my feeling is that if they put the conifer trees to complement the existing trees, you know, that separate Acorn Lane from the estates, I think that might suffice. I think there is for closing. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Agree with that solution. Anything else, Roger? I'm going to quit while I'm ahead. <laughs> Rick? 
Um, yeah, I think I think at 10 o'clock, uh, looking at the photometrics, I mean, there's very little spillover on the lights as it as it starts to move away from the structure. So, you know, it may be one of those things where it's a different schedule on a weekend versus a during the the day or during the work week. Uh, Monday through Fridays, guests may come more to the lodge uh, during the weekend and may stay a little longer. You're going to want to make sure they're safe to get out to their cars. Um, so maybe maybe there could be some sort of an advisory with the area neighbors about, you know, let's test what does it look like as we go through this and d develop a, a real schedule and incorporate an advanced lighting control system with this. There's a, enough lights that that would certainly be cost cost effective for putting in a lighting control system that would take care of the entire campus and you could do different um, timing strategies but I think having the, the spillover from the abutters they want to make sure that you know it, it from their perspective it's it's dark uh, but at the same time I hear you about the need for the safety and and the mobility of the residents that are there so I think there's some compromising that can be made. That's all I have. Thank you. All right. Um, you know, so for, for what it's worth, um, you know, I appreciate you taking uh, these steps for the additional buffering, um, reducing the time frame for, from 11 to 10. Uh, I think that's going to be helpful, eliminating that light pole. There's some pretty big items that you've, you've helped out with here. Um, to make it go a little smoother. I think we addressed uh, most all of the questions um, that came from the public this evening. We, we as a board have reviewed this plan. You want to put a number on it? Eight times, nine times? So, For a year. Um, it's been a little while. So uh, with that, uh, I'm going to read the motion. We're going to have an opportunity to deliberate on any of the points, if any of this board feels necessary. Uh, but at this time, I'm going to move to approve the project titled Piper Shores Dorado Site proposed by Maine Life Care Community as depicted on the plan set prepared by Sebago Technics dated 7819 <laughs> with the following findings and conditions. Findings. The applicant is proposing to continuing care retirement cons community consisting of 16 duplex units, mixed use common buildings consisting of 28 apartment units and a clubhouse facility and eight single family homes. The proposal also includes a public access trailhead, a 12.5 acre conservation easement, a public trail network interconnected with Camp Catcher Trails, an open space and other site improvements. The property is identified on the Town of Scarborough tax maps as map R94, lot 1D, and is subject to the provisions set forth in the approved contract zone agreement. The Planning Board has reviewed the application and supporting documentation and finds that the proposed design of the site plan adequately addresses the requirements of the subdivision, site plan review, and zoning ordinances. Conditions. One, given that the crosswalk across Spurwink Road is subject to Maine DOT approval, the following conditions apply. A, if Maine DOT approves the crosswalk, the final plans shall be reviewed and approved by the Planning Department, including the connection to the existing trails along Piper Road. B, if Maine DOT denies the crosswalk, the applicant shall submit revised plans that do not include the crosswalk to be reviewed and approved by the Planning Department. Further, the applicant shall contribute $40,000 instead of $25,000 to the town's multimodal reserve account. Two, prior to the release of the Mylar, the plan set shall be revised to include A, a plan note on the overall site plan stating that the walking trails on the property shall be maintained by Maine Life Care Community pursuant to the conservation easement. B, a plan note on the landscaping plan indicating that trees planted within the buffer located to the west of the proposed duplex buildings shall, sized in, shall be sized in accordance with the board's deliberation. C, an extension of the, of the row of tree plantings along the tree line to the west and north of the commons building parking field. D, an addition, an addition of a row of coniferous tree plantings along the tree line to the east of the single family homes and along and rear and side of the sewer pump station. E, Elimination of the proposed 20-foot light fixture adjacent to the sewer pump station and the addition of a building-mounted light over the access door. F. A plan note indicating the light fixtures will be dim dimmed at 10 p.m. G. Addition of the street names on all site plans, sheets 2 through 6 of 30. 
This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Three, prior relations of a building permit. The applicant shall A, pay the traffic impact fees. B, provide approval from the Scarborough Sanitary District. C, formally seek a written decision from Maine DOT on whether a traffic movement permit is required for the co combined Piper Shores campus. If a TMP is required, the applicant shall provide approval from Maine DOT. D, construct the berm and landscaping within the buffer located to the west of the proposed duplex buildings. E, execute and record maintenance agreement as required the post-construction stormwater management ordinance. Four, prior to the start of construction, the applicant shall A, submit the required groundwater and well monitoring plan to be reviewed and approved by the planning board. B, conduct a pre-construction meeting. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, their site contractor, and is to be coordinated through the planning department. The applicant will be required to identify their designated neighborhood liaison to which any neighbor's concerns and questions are to be directed through the construction process. Five, prior relations of a sign permit. The applicant shall provide a final signage plan. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. That is the motion. Second. I have a second. Any discussion on this? Could I ask for a clarification? And I see other hands going up, so I'll wait. Sure. <laughs> yes, Robin. Um, yeah, I'd just like to propose under 3B that it says provide approval from the Scarborough Sanitary District and DEP. Where is that implied? Somewhere else. Uh, the applicant provided their DEP permit. They did already. Yep. Okay. Any other discussion from the board? Yes, Roger. Um, on 3D, shouldn't we add prior to start of construction? Y yes, with the... Uh, well, it says prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall construct the berm and landscaping within the buffer. So they're they're going to have to do that before they build anything. Okay. So that's all set. I, I believe the language is okay. Is, is it? Yeah. Okay. Is it redundant? <laughs> I don't have it before me, but I know when Jamel and I looked at it, we were comfortable that it addressed the. Yeah, so yeah. before they can get a building permit, they need to construct the berm and landscaping okay. within right. the buffer zones. The, the, other, uh, the other thing I just wanted to get clarification on is uh, 2C. Um, that's the point I brought up about the tree plantings behind the commons. And it says here, uh, west and north of the commons building park and field, which I assume is that park and field which is basically west of the commons. And I just question the need to have that. Additional think, buffering right there. I think this is what Jay was pointing out. It might help. Is that the same spot you're referring to where Jay pointed out on the screen uh, well, where it, it might help some with some visuals for Acorn Lane? And, and I just also reiterate that the applicant has already agreed to these conditions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any other discussion from this board? No. I, I did have one question. Yes, I just Jack. want to be sure I'm clear. I, I did hear at one point discussion about, um, I believe it was 8 to 12 foot evergreens, and I, I just want to be sure. I thought that was, discussion was around um, the plantings that were going in sort of along the property boundary with acorn, um, but it could have been discussion around, I guess, what are the proposed tree size on the, um, the landscape berm to Newcomb? Um, I know 8 that to was, 12. That those are, okay. Great. I just wanted to be sure when the plans came in that staff was clear in what direction we were looking for. So, thank you. Okay. Yeah, uh, Jay, I, th I, I think um, you're also thinking about 2D, and that is the, uh, the height of the coniferous plantings around the single-family homes. Yeah. And that I have, uh, my notes say, 10 to 12 feet. And these are all going to be indicated on the plans, plan sets for... Any other discussion regarding the motion? No. All right. All in favor? Show that as unanimous. Congratulations. I know it's been a long process. Uh, I want to thank the public. Uh, your input during this was very, very valuable to everyone here. Um, and it was a long process. And I think um, not everyone might be happy with this, but there are plenty of people that will be happy. And hopefully we did this the right way. So good luck to you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We are going to take a five minute recess.
point overlay uh, and shoreland overlay, overlay zoning districts. So the applicant's proposing to place a 9,000 gallon nitrogen tank on an existing concrete pad adjacent to the existing facility on the property. Staff would like to note that the proposal seeks to place the tank, as I just said, on an existing pad, um, and I suggest that the applicant provide a vegetative buffer uh, between Jones Creek and the tank as practical. This would help to reduce the impact of the tank in relation to the water body. Staff has also recommended that the applicant provide a taller fence surrounding the tank to provide for uh, adequate screening. So the applicant should discuss this with the board. It also appears that the property is located within the A2 flood zone according to the FEMA floodplain maps. So the applicant will need to work with the codes department uh, through the building permit process uh, for the proposed tank to ensure it will meet the applicable flood zone standards. You know, staff has provided the board with a draft motion uh, for your consideration this evening. Thank you, Jamel. Appreciate it. <clears throat> the applicant like to introduce himself and the project, please. Yeah, uh, my name is Travis Letelier again, and it's Northeast Civil Solutions. Um, I think that's pretty much the project as it as it is. There's there's not a whole lot more to it. Um, as far as a vegetated buffer, I guess there's no real opposition to that, but we are, we are in a sort of industrial zone and, and, and it's, I guess I'm not really sure what the, what the vegetated buffer would do in this, in this sort of circumstance. Uh, we're, not at, we're not adding any impervious area or, or anything like that. It's, I don't think it's the, the greatest soils either, but, um, um, and as far as the fence, um, I think the six-foot fence provides the adequate uh, safety, um, sort of security for the for the for the tank. As far as screening, um, you're really only going to see this from Pine Point Road, which is another 15 to 20 feet above the level of, of this site. So, six-foot fence, 10-foot fence, you're going to sort of see the same the same view from from Pine Point Road, um, and. Uh, Oh, and with the A2 flood zone, I did talk to Brian Longstaff. Uh, his his concern is is basically anchoring. Um, they make sure that this doesn't float away during a large flood. So um, that will certainly be part of the building permit application plans. Um, would that open up to any comments or questions you have? Thank you, Travis. Uh, you have an opportunity for public comment this evening. Is there anyone here that would like to get up and speak? Seeing none, I'm going to close public comments now. Um, I'm just going to kind of uh, throw this one out for the board to consider. Uh, basically, you have the applicant's proposal and you have the staff's recommendations. Uh, I think it's really upon us to uh, weed through it and uh, give the applicant the clear direction. So uh, why don't we start with Robin? Um. Do you mind if I pass? <laughs> this is a first in planning board. I notes. know. <laughs> <clears throat> no, that's so fine. Sorry. Sometimes, uh, sometimes an extra minute to collect yeah. our thoughts and hear input Thank from you. other board members is helpful. So My apologies. We'll let Rachel kick it off then. Yeah, um, it, I guess my confusion is where Jones Creek actually gets closest uh, to the the tank because I'm I'm looking at the. Uh, the schematic here, the plan of the land, um, and I can see the tank, the little, that little red thing. Uh, I can see where Jones Creek enters onto the property, but then I'm not sure what happens to it, and I really need some, some of that, uh, I, I, need, I need to know where that is in order to make a really, uh, make a decision around mm -hmm. whether you need buffering or not. Yep. So if you can yep. kind of show me where that, where the creek goes. So Jones Creek runs out behind the back of the, the tank, the proposed tank. Um, it, actually, it actually runs through the building complex, um, out and around, and then, and then down towards the ocean underneath Pine Point Road. What you see um, in dark on this plan. Yeah, and, and it is the, um, it is within the FEMA 
It is. Uh, my initial take was I, I, I did look at the town's GIS, and, and the town's GIS doesn't show it within the flood zone, but uh, the actual 1985 map does show it within the flood zone. So, and it's is the current is it currently within the flood zone? The latest maps. Um, with with the, the newest uh, the newest FEMA maps, it does. It's also within the same flood zone. Okay, but now that I can see where Jones Creek goes, I am having, I, I think um, perhaps some buffering along the uh, along the fence would be helpful. Okay. So I have I commend the staff yeah. for doing the this work because it took me a while to figure out where. Um, you know, it was some of the details, so thank you. Do you, you have any, uh, do you have any input for the applicant on the height of the fence? Um, actually, I, I'm, I, I, uh, I am in sympathy with him because the Pine Point Road is raised up far enough that unless the whole tank were covered over, no matter how high the fence is, you're going you're gonna to see the tank. You're going to see the top of the tank. So I, I think I'm fine with the proposal if the applicant is Fine, uh, believes that that is enough security and um, that nobody's going to jump over a six foot fence. Thank you. Uh, Rick? Um, so the, the tank uh, appears to be like nine foot six high from the ground. And yeah. how, how is it six foot fence, you said? Correct. Um, yeah, I guess that's fine. It'd be nice if, just for our security reasons. What's the, what's the pressure in the tank, do you know? I, I don't know that off the top of my head. I think it's a lot. Yeah, that's... It, it's, it is probably clear. It's, you know, liquid nitrogen, so... Yeah. I'm okay with it. And I actually, I'd prefer to see like a 10. Would, do you have any aversion to putting a 10 foot fence there instead of a six foot fence? As far as security, it's going to be about the same. Uh, I mean, if you're going to climb. Well, as far as people right. jumping over it, but as far as seeing people seeing it from the street, you know, it's. it's Again, it's, you know, Pine Point Road is 15, 20 feet above. Uh, yeah. You're not going to not gonna notice the difference between a six and a 10 foot fence. Yeah, you're still going to see the tank. Yeah, um, that's a good Unless you're driving on Snow Canyon Road, it's, it's not going to make a difference. Yeah, that, that's, that's good. It's probably fine anyway. It's just be nice if it, you couldn't see it, but you're right from the vantage point. We, we'd have to road put road. a roof over it and it would be a whole yeah. different plan. So. Yeah, no, I'm okay with the way it's proposed. Thank you, Rick. Uh, Roger. <clears throat> um, regarding the buffering, what 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 is there right now? Do you have any idea? It's just just dirt, grass, and dirt, gravel. And yeah, yeah. Um, I feel like I'm becoming a, a non-buffering member of this board here, but um, we'll have to have a conversation, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> but when you travel along Black, um, Pine Point Road right there, it's quite a, quite a bit higher than what this. Facility is going it to be. It is, yes, yes. And I just, um, I'm okay with the fence because I agree with you. I mean, all you're going to see is the top of the tank. And I don't know what buffering is going to accomplish. Maybe somebody with some more knowledge than I have can, but I think it could be end up just being what, you know, wasted. And I don't think anybody's going to see it from the world or anything, so. Yeah, and so just to be clear, the buffering isn't really about a visual buffering at this point. It's really about pro providing protection to the Jones Creek. So that's a standard that's actually coming out of our shoreland zoning ordinance. So that's in, a requirement? In, well, so in the shoreland zoning ordinance in the uh, industrial overlay district, it talks about when a project comes in for a site plan or, or for a new structure to um, it's required to maintain a 25-foot vegetative buffer or the setback otherwise, um, and then that allows the setback to reduce down to 25 feet. If that 25-foot buffer isn't provided, then it's a 75-foot setback. In this case, obviously, or not obviously, in this case we have the, um, the cement, um, the, the 
the, pad. the foundation, the pad's there. So we're not really necessarily talking about changing anything on the face of the earth necessarily. Obviously we're putting a tank on the pad, but the pad is there. So as staff reviewed the provisions of the shoreland zone, recognizing the interest in trying to provide some type of buffering to, to the, um, the resource, that's where we thought that you know, that might be um, a, a small tip of the cap to the shoreland zoning provisions. Um, you know, if there were some sea rose or some hard, we recognize it would have to be probably some pretty hardy plant that goes back there. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of, so that, that, was, that was sort of the approach, if you, if you will, in, in, in staff comments. Um. Okay, thank you. Um, Rick. I can see why a 10 foot fence would be better than a six foot in that it could be a place, it's, you can jump over a six foot or it's easier to climb over a six foot than it is a 10 foot. And so for that reason, I, I think a 10 foot's appropriate. And, and uh, given, given what Jay just said, the buffering uh, sounds like it's a prudent thing to do. Thank you, Rick. Uh, I'm gonna weigh in. All right, I have my thoughts together if you're interested. In <laughs> you, can, you get to follow me. Okay. <laughs> we'll give you extra time. Um, so, uh, for what it's worth, yeah, I think we should put some buffering in. Um, not that, and, and it's buffering not for the sake of hiding anything. I think it's buffering mm -hmm. for the, the sake of the river, uh, or the waterway. So, um, yes, I'd like to see some buffering. I think staff is uh, being reasonable about the request, understanding that there's probably not a whole lot you can do in there, but let's make an effort. Um, and then as far as uh, the fence, my concern isn't, again, so much shielding the visual aspects of it as it is the safety aspects of it. Um, six feet fences can be climbed a lot easier than a 10 foot fence. Now, that said, um, I noticed that the proposal was chain, chain link fence. A 10 foot chain link fence is probably just as easy to climb over as a six foot one. So, take it for what it's worth. Um, I guess I'd prefer to see the 10 foot just for safety reasons, again, I fully acknowledging you're not really going to cover this big tank um, with not the intentions to. But uh, those are my two thoughts. Uh, Robin, your turn now. All right, thank you. Um, so where, where my mind goes is in long-term regulatory compliance, which is um, seated in security and um, exactly, I think, where... Um, Rick and Nick, you both are going in that if this were located in the state of New Hampshire, there's a long list of siting requirements um, for a nitrogen tank like this. Um, but we're not in New Hampshire, are we? We're in Maine. And unfortunately, we don't have those same siting requirements here. But what I would really appreciate the applicant to do is check with the local emergency planning Commission, which would be the County Emergency Management Agency, and um, they could even get you in touch with the right state and fire marshal officials in that this is, uh, pressurized nitrogen is a very much a, a safety and a security issue, and has even at times requires annual reporting under the Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act, um, Title II, Tier 2 and Tier 3. Um, to the Department of Homeland Security. So for those reasons, I feel like there is something out there, and that's what I was sort of trying to struggle with, is I feel like there's another authority out there who has basically already established performance standards for this type of tank. But I'm also, you know, in my mind going, I've totally walked by, beside this liquid nitrogen tank and in the old port, there's one right down by some of the other canning facilities there. And um, South Portland also has a very, um, I think, aggressive tank program um, in the area. So I guess I would just encourage staff to sort of encourage you to, to reach out to these other sort of performance standards that are on the, on the books that I believe are going to have regular regulatory compliance implications here and I think a 10 foot fence is the minimum of, of where this is this is going to go so um, with that I know it's a very 
I, I know that my answer is very um, in depth, but it, it's a security and a safety issue. And I, I just want to make sure that we have dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's and that the local review is going to be done in accordance with any regional, state, and county review. Yeah, I, I mean, I do know that this, will, this tank install will be done by a national company who, who does hundreds of these tanks. And, and uh, you know, it, it's not, it's not a, I, I just think that they, they know what they're, what they'll be doing. And, and, and I know that there's actually a, a tank right across the street as well at the, at the Bailey facility um, that, was, that was put in a few years ago. Uh, I think it's basically the same size. So, um, but I, I I know the company that's putting it in has has done many many of these of these tank installs. And just to be just to be um, clear, I want to let you know it's not just an installation issue for the owners. It's also an annual reporting requirement. Mm -hmm. So, if you already have one of these tanks, or if you're not already doing the annual reporting, check with your neighbors. Yes, to see who that they are you know, registering their tanks with and reporting annually. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Robin. So um, I think at this point, I'm gonna read the draft motion we have. Uh, more members can vote whether they agree or not with what's there in the language. I move to approve the site plan amendment project titled Proposed Nitrogen Tank Proposed by Blue Ocean Seafood as depicted on the plan set prepared by Northeast Civil Solutions dated 6 19 with the following findings and conditions. Findings, the applicant is proposing to place a 9,000 gallon, 40 foot long nitrogen tank on the existing concrete pad adjacent to the existing facility on the site. The property is located within the Pine Point Industrial Overlay and Shoreland Overlay Zoning Districts and is identified on the Town of Scarborough Tax Maps, Map R87, Lot 5. The Planning Board has reviewed the application and supporting documentation and finds that the proposed design of the site plan adequately addresses the site plan review, shoreland zoning, and zoning ordinance requirements for site utilization and layout, access, internal vehicular movement, pedestrian ways, landscaping, stormwater management, architecture, signage, utilities, and storage. Conditions. One, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall revise a plan set to include A, a vegetative buffer between Jones Creek and the proposed nitrogen tank as discussed with the Planning Board, B, additional details about the proposed fence materials and color, C, a taller fence surrounding the tank provided for adequate screening as discussed with the Planning Board. This shall be reviewed and approved by the Planning Department. Two, prior additions of a building permit, the applicant shall A, coordinate with the Codes Department to ensure the proposal will meet the flood zone standards. B, coordinate with the Scarborough Sanitary District as the project may require approval. Approval documents shall be provided to the Planning Department if required. Three, prior to start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, and their site contractor, and is to be coordinated through the planning department. That is the motion. Do I have a second? Second. The motion is second. Any discussion? All in favor? Sure that is. There we go. We're back on. For those at home that missed that, that was a unanimous vote. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we're back to number 11. Jason Chisholm requests a sketch plan review for 96 Gorham Road, Assessor's Map R54, Lot 11. Jim Elk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this is located in the VR4 uh, zoning district along Gorham Road. The applicant's in front of the board this evening with a sketch plan for a 16-lot residential subdivision uh, served by a public road. Uh, just a reminder to the board and the applicant that the sketch plan review is an opportunity for the board and the applicant to have a high-level uh, discussion about the proposal. As the board may recall, the VR4 zoning district standards are intended to promote the establishment of a higher-density village-style development with an interconnected network of landscape streets and pedestrian ways. 
The applicant has provided an extended right-of-way to the westerly property line. Staff would like to point out that the proposed Cottages at Sawyer project will be also providing a right-of-way that will end at this property line as well. So there appears to be a good opportunity to coordinate between the two projects uh, to enable for a future connection between Sawyer and Gorham Road. The zoning standards uh, require developments to be clustered away from wetlands um, and other water bodies. The standards also require a 25-foot wetland buffer. Um, it appears the additional it appears that additional lots in the development will need the required buffer from the wetlands. And the zoning standards seek to have sidewalks on both sides of the streets, uh, but given the limited lots in the development, staff suggests that the board and the applicant have a discussion about providing funds equal to the construction of a sidewalk along one side of the road to the town's multimodal reserve account. And now I think Angela would like to discuss some utility uh, comments. Um, in, in the staff comment, one of the first things we talked about was uh, obviously we're in the middle of construction on Gorham Road. I have met with the applicant. Um, we talked about that early on for the past few months. We've been talking about <clears throat> any um, anything getting into the right of way, really cutting into that road, because really that window is closing fast. Um, so I know in the application they're now proposing to bore under the roadway um, so they won't have to cut into the pavement um, obviously there's some concerns with that it's just as long as the applicant knows the risk going into that um, we do typically have a five-year moratorium on the roadway so in order to cut into the road you'll need to wait that's a DOT standard that's a local standard um, this is actually a DOT arterial and so that would have to be enforced for this roadway and so I just want to make sure that it's part of our conversation <clears throat> is that in some instances that we are finding along Gorham Road even though you bore under the roadway a lot of the utilities including gas and water have asked that you actually open up the pavement so they can actually see the pipe going underneath their pipe and that there isn't a conflict so I guess I just want to make sure that if any utility company is asking for that that kind of stops that process um, for, for boring under that road. Or we talk about something pretty dramatic on repair of Gorham Road because it's, we'll, we're investing a lot of million, millions of dollars into Gorham Road right now, and so we don't really want it patched up in different, uh, a quilt kind of pattern when we first get done. So I know we've had this conversation, um, and I just want to, I'm gonna keep beating that drum that it's really a lot of risk moving ahead so as long as they're aware of that so that's why I'm... thank you Angela mm -hmm. if you'd like to go ahead and introduce yourself and your project I'm Rich Wasina with Lewis and Wasina land surveyors and uh, I do appreciate the time to present this and I, I certainly appreciate your your concerns Angela and um, you know we we would have loved to have gotten this done before, but it, it didn't happen, and so now we're seeking alternatives. And it just seems to me that uh, boring under the road makes the most sense. Um, I, I think um, going trenchless, there isn't gonna be any more issues than if we were to actually dig down the road. I still think you're gonna have to look for the utilities. I mean, we, the, the water's on our side of the road. It's completely out of the right of way, so that's not an issue. Um, the force main, the existing force main that's there, I believe, is right on the edge of pavement or in the shoulder. So, I, where where David Hughes wants us to go, which is in the uh, westerly travel lane, I don't believe there's anything there. The gas is actually <laughs> on the other side of the road. So, I mean, sure, there there could be some risk, but I mean, it doesn't seem um, like it's all that bad. Dave Hughes has also commented during our, because he's part of our staff review meetings, has commented that if the alternative, if there becomes issues getting out of the right of way, he was saying to go alongside where the force main and the 16 inch water is, is not, is a kind of a, a stopping point. We can't really get any more utilities along that side of the right. roadway, so it kind of limits you. Yep. And so that's what we're hearing also from the sewer district. So I think we're all on the same page with that. Um, and obviously you've heard it from me and you've probably heard that from Dave, so. No, we we have heard from Dave that he does not want to go in the, sho in the shoulder. And, and, and we understand that. We're gonna, we're gonna comply with his request to go in the travel lane and there there isn't anything in the travel lane, so we should be okay.
any other elements you'd like to discuss regarding your plan with the board? Um, well, I mean, Jamel did write me a nice three-page um, summary. With, so there's a, there's a few things in here. I mean, a lot of these, obviously, we're at sketch plan. So, you know, I think the standard answer for a lot of this stuff is that we certainly acknowledge it and we would be working with the planning department to uh, comply with the ordinance and make those things happen. But there were a couple of things that I did want a clarification on. Um, We good? Yeah, thank you. Uh, one of the things that you had mentioned is that uh, we abut the cottages. Um, we actually do not. I know that the tax map shows that we abut, but we, but we don't. I mean, I, in this case, the tax map, I think, is wrong. So we, we have shown, you know, a future right away heading over in that direction, but there is actually no property that, that abuts. So, I mean, I'm not sure. Um, you know, we certainly can't do that because we don't own that property. So that would be one thing. And then, uh, uh, there was some, there's some talk about the 25 foot buffer, um, that we did not buffer lots one, two, three, five, eight, nine, and 10 on the sketch plan. Um, it was my understanding that it's uh, contiguous wetlands, 15,000 square feet or greater, needed the buffer. Those lots, um, those wetlands were less than 15,000 square feet, so that's why we didn't buffer those. So I just want to make, get a clarification on that, make sure we're all set there with how we've shown that. All right. Uh, Anything else or what, board uh, comments? Just a couple other items, maybe, sure. if that's okay. Um, you, know, you know, sidewalks and paving width. Uh, we've heard a lot about sidewalks and, and with the paving tonight. So um, we're, we're inclined to, you know, propose 22 feet and a sidewalk on one side. And I just wanted to get a sense from whether or not that seemed doable. Um, the planning department thought that it would be. Angela just really didn't want us to go below 22 feet. She made that pretty clear, so. It can be educational sitting in the audience for the entire meeting, right? It sure, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, and, and then jumping to the um, net residential area calculations. Um, Uh, we did not include the proposed stormwater management facilities, so I just wanted to put that out there. I don't know, I mean, unless there's something I'm missing, but. Can I ask a question? So the 40,000 that you, I think it's 40. It, that's that's exi That was deducted, yes. <coughs> okay. I mean, we can certainly work, obviously on that, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that's correct. So I just want to make sure I was, wasn't missing anything. That's, I mean, those are my big questions that I had based on your, I mean, again, most of the stuff, um, we, we acknowledge it and we certainly plan to work with uh, staff to meet the ordinance. Thank you. Um, can I ask a quick question about the Village Green open space and the trail access? Sure. So the trail access, is that that's existing or is that what you're proposing and does it link into that Scarborough Land Trust Conservation? Is there a trail system in there that it links into? That's, that's what we're proposing to do. The, okay. we, we abut the conservation and so we would like to, to build um, a trail system to link up to that property as part of the, the uh, green space. And then the other green space would be a linear greenway on the, on the right side coming in. It's, 
it's essentially all open and, and grass now, so we might as well keep it like that. And, and the Village Green open space, it's at the top of the plan. Is that just a just open space recreation? Are you planning to maybe put some sort of features in there, or is it what's your what's your intention with that area? My initial thought was just uh, basically a trailhead. I suppose you could put you know a kiosk with some maps and stuff in there, but I mean it was essentially just a trailhead to link up with that. Uh, you know, but we are at Sketch Plan too, so we're just kind of sure still working on what we could do there. I mean. Uh, does anyone on the board have any general questions or comments for the applicant? Yes, Rachel. Yeah, um, actually, you, you broached the area that, uh, one of the areas I was interested in, in addition to the sidewalk, thank you. Um, and, and that is, uh, you've got the future right of way uh, that actually kind of leads to the end of the property and that also leads to the trail access and to the village green area. So I think what you, one of the things you're going to have to do as you consider this is how you're going to treat the access from the hammerhead to those, to those two areas and whether you're going to provide public parking uh, for that access to the trailhead, um, what that whole area might look like. And usually when we see something that says a village green, there are some features. Um, whether there's a gazebo or some benches or um, <coughs> a play area of some sort f for kids. Um, let me uh, direct you to the, um, the Scarborough Downs uh, project that has a, a, an area in the pocket neighborhood where what they're doing is they're providing some natural features <clears throat> that children can climb on or can walk around or can play on. I don't mean providing swings, but, sure. but something that creates um, a place that people want to go to, not just, oh yeah, we've got some green space down there, but let's take the kids or let's have a picnic or let's gather down there. So any way that you can connect, understanding that you've got the, the paper, uh, paper right of way, you've got a future right of way there, any way that you can connect that open space, um, that village green is, is going to be to your advantage. Um, <clears throat> and I think that indeed it is more in line with the, uh, with the zoning ordinance uh, in terms of requirements for uh, this district, that there be contiguous uh, village green areas, and you have the opportunity to do that in addition to creating that trail access for the people. I would also want to know what you're going to be doing down that linear greenway, um, if you're planning on doing anything. It also is a village green area. Um, if the sidewalks are going down that side, are you going to be doing some benches along there? It's, it, it, this is something for you, sure. you know, to, to think about as, as, you go, as you go forward. The concept of this uh, particular uh, zoning is that you are creating a community. Uh, you cannot set out the, the sort of grid community that, that zoning requires, not given the, or, or asked for, not given the, the property that you have, but you can create that in a, that neighborhood concept in a different way. Yeah. And that's providing places for people to sit down, people, places for people to chat, um, the access, uh, and a gathering point for the community. So that's something that, as you go along, that I would be looking at. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Anyone else wanna jump in? Yeah, Roger. Um, up there, the uh, future right away, um, what does that abut? Does that abut Valancourt's property or does that abut the um, land trust? It, it actually abuts Valancourt. Valancourt, okay. Yeah. And so that must be between the cottages at Sawyer? There appeared to be a, a way that a, we, our cottages at Sawyer would connect into this. Um, we'll have to sit down with the applicant and, and figure that out. Okay. Um, I, and and uh, Mr. Chisholm owns 
all this other property around here, including right underneath that trail access area, that's his property as well? Correct, and, okay. and actually none of that was included in any of the calculations. We just went right to the, right to this line here. So that's, that's just gonna be free open space, really. Oh, he has no plans to ever develop that at all? No, it's, it's, it's pretty wet. Oh, it is okay. Yeah. What about down below that that property owns down below? Is that? No, he's he is going to retain that. Okay. Yeah. Just probably mostly as a as a buffer. I, I guess I have a question for Angela. Um, I'm kind of curious. What is the risk that they may incur just bumping into all the other other utilities or? Oh, you mean Gorham Road? Yeah. Yeah, I I think that is. It's been a unique project because it seems like um, there's a lot of unknowns in Gorham Road just because of the age of the infrastructure out there. So what we have found is um, a lot of troubleshooting around utilities. Everyone knowing it, we know where the utility is, and then we're in the road and finding it's not it's six feet in another location or things like that. So I'm a little gun shy because <laughs> I've been dealing with it for a long time. That when you say this is a known, it's not finding that on Gorham Road. So it makes me a little nervous. And so that's all I'm saying is I'm not saying that this is a, a no-go. No I'm saying I think they're being creative and trying to find a way to get through this. Um, <clears throat> I'm just putting out that warning that what we have found in other, the rest of Gorham Road is that a lot of utilities, they're nervous as well and wanting to see, even when you do a trenchless drill, you're, you're watching it go by. You have to open it up and see it. And where I think Rich is talking about is kind of mapping out where the existing utilities are. It sounds like this is doable. I'm just a little happy. Well, I <laughs> and Roger, if, if I could just sort sure. of add to that, I think the, the, the risk becomes, you know, certainly obviously there's a risk bumping into utility. That's well understood, but I think that the concern further is if either something happens or one of the utilities comes along and says, no, we want, we want to see that, that to cut into that road would that. require, one, he either <laughs> couldn't do it for five years, so it's, you know, so I think that's the risk. But if something does happen, let's say we say, okay, go ahead, we don't have to cut in, look, then something happens and, he, and there's an emergency and now we have to cut in that road, that's going to be a tremendous cost because he's not just fixing that one little patch. You know, as roads get older, right, you see patches along the roadway. When the road's new, the expectation is that you're going to re redo that whole thing. Because we just built it, as Angela said, spent millions of dollars. So that's why the five-year moratorium is put in place, is so that, sure. you know, that... Now, now, are you considering boring underneath Gorm Road or, or going just to Gorm Road? No, it would be underneath Gorm Road. Okay, so is there something on the other side then? But, but we're no, not going to the other and side. And they'll do a 90. They'll actually bore in and do a 90 and go up the road. So they will follow the, the roadway. They will go under where the cars are driving. They'll right. Go yeah, okay. hundred, you know, I don't know how many feet, hundreds of feet, I don't know, uh, but up the roadway. And so. In, so. In, in, in underground utilities, I mean, the, sure, there are surprises. I mean, I'm not going right. to uh, doubt that. But... In this case, it does seem like the, the gas is on the far side, and that mm -hmm. they seem to know that. The water is not even in the right-of-way. Um, so really, it would be the force main, the existing force main, and um, David Hughes seems to be on board with what we're doing. So, I mean, okay. I, I think, you know, I, I mean, I acknowledge that there's a risk, mm -hmm. but, I mean, I don't think we'd be doing it if we thought it was, re you know, just a stupid risk. I mean, and if it would help, I think... What we would end up doing, like as Jay is saying, um, we can also map up for, out for you kind of in the case of an emergency yep. where you need to cut into the road, and that's what it would have to be in order right. to, to go against a moratorium. It would have to be an emergency situation yep. that we have had instances in town where that has happened because things mess up and a water main breaks or something like that. And we talk about having, as Jay said, really... Um, curb line to curb line or shoulder to shoulder in this case, paving that width 
and then for an extended period of uh, portion so that you're actually you have a bump going into that and you have a bump going out but it's it's a long enough distance you can transition so you're not just hitting some a trench you know what i'm saying yeah. so we can kind of map that out too um, and discuss that a little bit with staff um okay um just as a curiosity uh, are the property owners along that stretch of road are they all aware of this five-year moratorium and yeah, and that's where we started with the conversation, like with the cottages. They did their work this past um, year to yeah. try to get sleeves across and different things like that, and they actually ended up boring some some in there too. But it was early yeah. enough in our construction. They were obviously further along right. in the process, and so they were able to look ahead and kind of to get ahead of that. But we've had also people you know adding gas services and things like that. So we've notified everyone who's trying to get any utilities they can done and out of the way okay i just um thinking about this other piece of land that mr chisholm owns mm -hmm. it looks like there's a drainage right away or something like that that could probably tie in uh, i don't know but i guess i'm i can't talk about buffering so i'm all set <laughs> <laughs> is anyone else on the board anything for the applicant before he goes on to the next round yes robin do you know what watershed you're in I believe it's uh, Millbrook. Okay. Um, and there was a comment made that there was a, a tributary stream on our property, and there is not. So um, I, I would like to work with staff on that to figure out. It's it's there's there's a there's a man-made ditch on there, but there's no there's no tributary stream. It was a waterfront property. And so are we this, I'm going to call it the larger rectangle, like right here. That's yep. pretty much all wetland, right? No. This, this, this part's wetland, and there's some wetland up here, but obviously everywhere the lots are, they're, they're not. I mean, there's a little bit um, that comes in here, there's a finger, and there's another piece, but both, both of those wetlands are less than 15,000 square feet, so that's why there's no buffer to it. So you have tried to sort of minimize your wetland impacts by having the spine of the road, so to speak, Correct. Yep. follow the upland. That's, that's why we really can't comply with the grid layout. So um, we've, we really wanted to minimize the impacts. I mean, that's... So are we looking at the, the light gray behind it? Are, those are existing conditions, correct? You mean the light gray? Yeah, hatching? topo lines, yeah. Existing conditions? Correct, yes. So what's that steep grade then around lot five? That's that man-made ditch. Mm -hmm. Somebody somebody dug it out and left the material up on the bank. So and I mean it happened a long time ago, but it's there used to be a, a farming residence there. It burned, I think in two thousand and seven. But there was there was a barn, there was a house, there was a riding arena. There's a long existing driveway there. It's I mean, where are you going to put your stormwater feature? It's going to be over here. And you know, right now, Sebago Technics is working to design, and they're anticipating an undersoil filter drain. Um, and they're working with Angela to meet all the requirements that the town has. It's a very challenging site, not only from uh, the utility standpoint that we've already discussed, but all of these wetlands are considered waters of the United States and are going to require consideration. Mm -hmm. And this part of town, it's, it's, you know, cattails on both sides of the road. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's going to be a challenge. It's going to be a challenge. And, and um, in, in this kind of environment, the upland environment, you know, to try to, are you thinking like curb and gutter to collect and then concentrate it to the stormwater management feature? 
Correct. It, 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 you know, we are figuring uh, gutters, and then we're going to have underground drainage taking it to the... Uh, you, just remember, you can't push on rope. I mean, as my statics teacher always said, you got, you got, mm, you, you're going to have high water and low ground and no trees and good luck. <laughs> I'm sorry. I wish I could be more optimistic, but it's um. Thank you. But it's uh, a challenge. Any other members of the planning board have any comments before he goes on his way? No? All right. Look forward to seeing this when it comes back. Thank you. I appreciate Thanks. it. And that concludes the business section. We're now into the staff report. Jamel. Uh, just real quick, the, uh, since the downs was approved, there is a Mylar here. Um, Do you need to look at the details before we have a sign of the... Um, I don't know, Jay. What do you think? Because we saw the one glitch earlier. I... We should probably review it. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I, I was going to say this may be one that we want to take a look at. And if it's ready, we'll have you come in in between meetings to sign if members are going to be around. Okay. I don't have anything else. Right. I don't know if anyone else does, but. Administrative amendment report. Uh, none at this time. And any correspondence? Planning board comments. Any comments? Yes, Rachel. It's not a comment so much as a question. Um, have have there been any uh, um, building permits issued on any of the projects that we've dealt with recently? I'm just wondering how things are going in terms of some of these developments, and also um, what's going on with Verizon. Is there any any update on that? Uh, we haven't had any pre-construction meetings since the last meeting. Um, so in terms of projects you've reviewed, um, we are getting building permit applications in for various subdivisions like Tucker Brook and Ridgewood Farm, right? Um, so there's been a few trickling in, uh, but other than that, uh, we haven't seen anything else. And I'll let my colleagues talk to Verizon if there's any update. I haven't heard from Verizon in some time, so. Roger. Yeah, along the same lines, are there any um, projects that we approved that have been set aside or they've declined to go forward with them? Uh, not that I know of. Um, I did touch base with the Bluebird self-storage folks, and they are still planning on building. I don't know if you're referring to that, but. Um, what about the Acura dealership? Anything on that? I think they're waiting on their DEP permit, but I could be wrong. Um, I think they had a six month. Okay. Um, haven't heard otherwise, though. Any other planning board comments? All right, with that, I'll make a motion to adjourn. Okay. All in favor? <laughs> we are adjourned. Thank you, guys.